Chapter 661 Making coffee was one of the many things Sophia did not know how to do. She usually got her coffee from a local barista or any other cafe. Right now, she tossed Arthur a pleading look, trying to get help. When he saw the despair in her wide doe eyes, he repressed the urge to sigh in frustration. She can't iron, and she can't make coffee. Is there anything she knows how to do other than talk back to someone? We don't have a proper coffee machine here, he lied to Emily after glaring at Sophia. I'll send someone out to get one for you if you'd like. Emily was more than aggravated now. Well, how about tea? Surely, she can bring me tea. She was trying to gauge how important this so-called maid was to Arthur, and there was no hiding the fact that Emily hated Sophia's guts. Hence, the former was currently thinking of ways to get rid of the latter and eradicate any good impression Sophia might have made on Arthur. I have to make Artie hate her too. That way, if he decides to keep her, I can order her around as I like. Emily knew she had to nip this in the bud before she ended up losing Arthur to some tramp maid. At once, Sophia bustled off into the kitchen to make tea, which, thankfully, was something she knew how to do. She had made the tea and brought the tray over to the couch. But just as she was setting down the cups on the coffee table, Emily asked, You're a maid, aren't you? Where is your uniform? Emily was immediately unhappy when she noticed that Sophia was wearing a nice dress, not to mention, looking really good in it. Sophia's eyes flickered over to Arthur as she said slowly, I've only started work a month ago, so I don't have a uniform, then I shall get one ready for you, Emily declared with a smirk. There's no need for that, Arthur interjected. Honestly, I find uniforms to be a stuffy concept, this made Emily choke on her tea. She began to wonder just who Sophia was to warrant such concern from Arthur, who was famed for being stoic, and why he kept speaking up for her. Thank you, young Master Weiss, Sophia said, then backed out of the living room. She had a feeling that her life here wasn't going to be all rainbows and butterflies now that Emily had moved in. That woman's a jealous one, she thought grimly. Still, she would not have to suffer like this if she could find that man's necklace. Where could that family heirloom possibly be? She wanted to cry out in exasperation. Of all the people she could have a score to settle with, it just had to be an eccentric jerk like Arthur. Meanwhile, over at the press graves, Anastasia received a call from Lorelai that morning. Lorelai told Anastasia that she was desperate to design the perfect jewelry for her friend's engagement and that she was wondering if she could drop by to have Anastasia's input on the design sketches today. Naturally, Anastasia did not reject her plea for help and invited her over to the house without hesitation. At 4.0 p.m. that day, Lorelai drove into the car porch of Elliot's villa. She walked through the front door and into the living room, whereupon she was greeted by Anastasia, who looked like a vision dressed in a soft-colored long dress. Lorelai, Mrs. Pressgrave, please, call me Anastasia. Mrs. Pressgrave sounds too formal, Anastasia said kindly. I've been wanting to address you by your first name since the first time we met, but I didn't want to offend you, Lorelai explained. With a self-mocking smile, she added, our family's really strict about formalities, it's fine. You can call me by my name when it's just the both of us, Anastasia said with a smile. She then proceeded to appraise Lorelai's get up today. The latter was dressed appropriately in an outfit that included dark academia elements with just an understated feminine appeal. She was also wearing very light makeup that accentuated her delicate features. Upon taking the sketch from Lorelai and giving it a cursory look, Anastasia praised, there's definitely talent here and creativity too, just said an inspiration, I guess, Lorelai said humbly laughing. I don't have much time usually, what with business investments and all, Anastasia highlighted several parts of the design that needed to be smoothed over and suggested several ways Lorelai could achieve it. The latter nodded delightedly and said, You really are a professional, Anastasia. Chapter 662 Having pointed out a few more things and shared a few insider's tricks with Lorelai, 
Anastasia didn't even notice that an hour had passed until she checked the time and saw that it was already 5.3 p.m. She thereafter rose to have the kitchen prepare dinner, but just as she was about to invite Lorelai to stay, the girl shook her head and said she had to leave. Thank you for the invitation, Anastasia, but I have something planned for tonight and I should go, Lorelai explained, gathering her things as she got off the couch, but it's already so late and Elliot will be home soon. Come on, stay for dinner, Anastasia insisted. It's really so nice of you to offer, but I couldn't impose, not tonight at least. Dinner's on me next time, okay? Lorelai said, politely but firmly turning Anastasia down. In that case, I'll see you some other day, Anastasia walked with her out the door and to the car. Sliding into the driver's seat, Lorelai gave her a small wave and said, Thanks for today. I'll see you around. Drive safe, returning the wave, Anastasia watched as the car pulled out of the porch and out the front gates. Presently, the vibrant sunset glow was cast over the garden, coating it in a warm golden hue. There were thoughts behind Anastasia's clear, bright eyes as she stood outside. She did not go back into the living room. Instead, she glanced at the watch on her wrist. Jared should be home by now. As expected, the fleet of cars escorting the little boy pulled up outside the house but did not drive in. Jared leaped out of one of the cars and dashed through the gates. He ran up to Anastasia when he saw her and asked happily, Mommy, were you waiting for me? Yes, I was, she answered with an affectionate smile. He beamed and held her hand while, exclaiming, I love you so much. Mommy, I love you too, she reached out to ruffle his hair then led him into the house. When Jared got into the living room and saw the kitten darting back and forth on the couch, he quickly set his bag aside and began to play with the feline. The little furball had only grown cuter since they first got it. A little later into the evening, a black Bugatti sports car drove and parked on the car porch. The soft purr of the car engine indicated that Elliot had returned. Anastasia was reading on the grassy lawn right outside the living room while Jared was playing with the cat. When she saw Elliot walking up to her with his silhouette outlined by the twilight glow, she set her book down and ran to meet him in the middle. She had missed him dearly after not seeing him for the whole day. Upon seeing her running his way, Elliot opened his arms and caught her just as she threw herself into his embrace like a child. He lifted her up by the waist and twirled her once, then set her back down. Missed me? He asked teasingly. There was a warm and gentle gleam in his eyes as he kissed her forehead indulgently. She nodded, smiling as she said, I did. Daddy, I want a kiss too, Jared demanded as he approached the loving couple with the kitten in his arms. Elliot let go of Anastasia and bent to pick up the little guy, then kissed him on the cheek lovingly. Did you have fun at school today, Jared? You bet. Jared replied with a firm nod. The kitten looked decidedly unhappy when it saw that everyone else had received Elliot's affection. Meow. Chapter 663 Having considered the feline to be part of the family, Elliot reached out to pat its soft, furry head and asked, You're not angling for a kiss too, are you? The kitten meowed once more as if to answer in the affirmative. Amusement seized Elliot as he continued scratching the cat behind its ears to placate it. There was a serenity in the way the family of three and their cat hung out with each other under the evening sky. For a while, it was as if the world was at peace. Meanwhile, Lorelai was on her way home when she called her mother and told her what happened with Anastasia. Upon hearing the details, Kendra said on the other line, You did the right thing, Lorelai. That way, Anastasia won't be suspicious of you or see you as a threat. Lorelai had deliberately dropped by Anastasia's house during the late afternoon and left before dinner time just so the latter wouldn't think she was trying to butt into her family affairs. The clever planning would help Lorelai make a good impression on Anastasia, who would then put her guard down. Presently, there was an ambitious glimmer in Lorelai's eyes as she said, By the way, Mom, I've already sent in my resume to Pressgrave Group. That's a little too soon, Lorelai. My father said not to rush the plan, remember? After all, Elliot is still in his honeymoon phase with Anastasia. 
You ought to wait until she's got a second kid on the way before you make a move. Mom, don't worry. I'm only doing this to gauge Elliot's feelings for me. That's all, Lorelai explained. It was like playing chess, and every move she made along the way was intentional with a purpose behind it. Very well, but make sure that you pace yourself and don't muck up our plans. I know, Mom. I'll be careful, Lorelai promised calmly. It was 10.0 p.m. when Anastasia got out of the shower that night to get ready for bed, only to see the kitten clambering onto the couch, its claws digging into the fabric as it launched itself onto the padded cushion. It let out a soft mule as though to insist it could make it on its own. Anastasia sat down to the side and asked in amusement, shouldn't you be with your darling little master instead of hanging out in our room? The kitten managed to get onto the couch, and as a reward, it staked out a corner and curled up in it, then dozed off. Just then, the bedroom door opened and Elliot walked in dressed in his lounge suit. He had only just wrapped up an online conference with international affiliates, and there was an imperial, decisive, and deadly air about him that made him all the more attractive. Anastasia loved it when he wore suits, and she couldn't help the primal urges that seized her during moments like these. It was an almost feral instinct that made her want to leap over and help him shed the stoic-looking suit. However, she had seen the hidden side of him, the side that lay on the other end of the spectrum from his aloof state. As though reading her mind, Elliot kissed the top of her head and murmured as he undid the buttons of his suit, Give me twenty minutes, she smiled and asked innocently, and what will you do after twenty minutes? Bemused, he raised a brow and gave her a knowing look. What do you think? I'm afraid the idea will have to be put till a week later, she confessed, not wanting to give him the satisfaction. Off he understood immediately. Flashing her a roguish grin, he teased, well, in that case, perhaps I should save up my energy till then, she pouted and gave him a somewhat distressed look, to which he responded with a laugh as he headed into the shower. When he was done, he came out of the bathroom and saw her curled up in bed. He slid under the covers while she was still reading and pulled her into his arms so that she could lean against him. Honey, I don't want to be a housewife anymore, Anastasia grumbled softly. Elliot stroked her hair tenderly and said, you can do whatever you want. Chapter 664 I want to take charge of bourgeois, Anastasia said as she looked up at Elliot. Frances initially wanted her to continue managing Tillman Constructions, but she had no interest whatsoever in building materials, so he decided that he would hand the business over to Elliot after retirement. All right then, you'll be the commander-in-chief for Bourgeois from tomorrow onward, Elliot said. He couldn't care less about profit margins and operating costs as long as his wife could amuse herself. He would always be there as a safety net for her. Warmth surged through Anastasia when she heard this, but before she could thank him, he added, Go and do whatever you like. Don't you worry about a thing, because I'm always going to be here to catch you when you fall, okay? In that quiet room, Elliot's tender love, an indulgence for Anastasia seemed audible in his words. He sounded firm and assuring, making her heart skip a beat. Upon hearing the solemn promise underlying his bold statement, she felt like she was in the safest harbor, protected by some great universal force. She could do whatever she liked, and if she messed things up, he would always be there to help her get through it. She did not need to worry about a thing, because he was the fort that would keep her shielded from the brutal consequences of failure. That said, Anastasia knew taking over Bourgeois was not just a game she decided to play on a whim. Now that she had voiced out her desire to run it, she would have to make her words count and show him she was not just doing it out of fun. She had a duty to be a better version of herself, because how else would she live up to the name of being Elliot's wife? Meanwhile, in Arthur's villa, Sophia was having a hard time falling asleep after binge-watching several episodes of a new hit drama through the night. She got out of bed and padded out of her room to get a glass of water, hoping that sleep would come after that. She opened the door softly. She was staying on the third floor while Arthur and Emily were resting on the second. While heading downstairs, she kept her footfalls as quiet as possible, 
so much so that she was practically tiptoeing. Much like a wary kitten, she made her way to the first floor and hurried into the kitchen, following the low hum of the refrigerator. She thought a cold drink was suitable in light of the rising temperatures as they welcomed the beginning of summer. Just then, a cold and crisp voice spoke up behind her. What are you doing up in the middle of the night? Sophia gasped and turned around, but she did so too quickly and ended up bumping her head against the door of the freezer compartment. The loud thud resonated throughout the kitchen like an ominous drumbeat. Could you not creep up on me like that? For heaven's sake, you had me half scared to death, she snapped, rubbing the sore spot on her head as she shot Arthur a resentful look. Arthur came up to her. He was a head taller than her, and he was here to get a drink as well. The refrigerator light cast a warm glow on both of their silhouettes as they stood there facing each other. At that moment, Sophia noticed the carton of milk on the top row of the refrigerator and reached up to grab it. However, her fingertips could barely brush it. She was just about to give up when a large hand easily grabbed it and handed it to her. As she took over the milk, she looked up at the man to thank him, only to be caught off guard. He seemed to have slept before coming. Downstairs, his ink-colored hair was currently tousled over his forehead, unlike during the day. He was peering into the fridge for something to drink as well, revealing his side profile, which was all sharp jawline and delicately chiseled features. He looked breathtaking. Presently, Arthur sensed Sophia staring at him, and he looked down with narrowed eyes as he demanded, What are you looking at? Huh? Oh, uh, nothing, Sophia muttered lamely, breaking eye contact. Her heart was beating so loud and fast that it was a wonder he didn't hear it. Swallowing convulsively, she darted around him as she was about to leave. In the end, he grabbed another bottle of milk off the top row of the refrigerator and closed the door. The hallway grew dim immediately in the absence of the refrigerator light, and Sophia, who was hardly paying any attention while walking, accidentally slipped on one of the steps. There was a thud as she fell, bashing her knee on the steps as Shell grappled around in the dark to steady herself. Ow! She winced at the pain that tore through her knee. She must be bleeding. By now, the fall had scraped the skin of her knee. At the sight of this, Arthur came up to her and frowned. How did she even manage to survive all the way into adulthood? Presently, Sophia had eased herself into a sitting position on the stairs and her face was all scrunched up with pain as she gingerly rolled up her pajama pants. Sure enough, both her knees were bleeding. What's going on up in that brain of hers? Arthur stared at her wounds in disbelief, then crouched down to examine them as he scolded, don't you watch where you walk? Sophia looked up at him incredulously. He was the reason why she had slipped and fallen on the staircase like an idiot with no motor skills. It wasn't her fault that he looked that good in the refrigerator light and made her rethink how handsome he actually was. I'm fine, she said with a steely edge in her voice, then slowly tried to get up. Sit down, Arthur ordered. She was stunned when he straightened up and found his way to the sideboard, then returned with a first aid kit in hand. I can do that myself, Sophia said anxiously. She was terrified of the stinging, burning pain that came with the menial procedure of cleaning up one's wounds, and she would much rather do it herself than have him administer first aid on her. Chapter 665 Arthur, however, ignored Sophia and proceeded to clean up her wounds with a sterilized Q-tip. When he went on to apply the antiseptic, she hissed in pain and gasped softly. Ow, that hurts. The way she yelped was so suggestive that Arthur stopped and shot her a freezing look, as though angry that his testosterone decided to react to her voice. At present, neither of them noticed the fuming figure that stood on the second floor landing with her hand on the banister. Emily had been awakened by the ruckus downstairs, so she came out of her room and Sophia's soft moans of pain sounded. She then decided to head downstairs only to see Arthur helping the girl clean her bleeding shins. One could call it first aid, but to Emily, who was so blinded by jealousy she could hardly think straight, Sophia was a cunning vixen who had resorted to such cheap acts to win over Arthur's attention. What happened, Arthur? Emily asked aloud. 
pretending as if she had been woken up by the commotion as she continued her way down the rest of the steps. Sophia hurriedly rolled down the legs of her pajama pants and apologized. Did we wake you, Miss Jennings? I'm terribly sorry for that. Did something happen to you? Emily asked, meeting the other girl's gaze confrontationally. I fell and scraped my knees earlier, so Mr. Weiss helped me stop the bleeding, Sophia answered frankly. Well, if you're not bleeding anymore, then go back to your room, Emily bit out grimly. Arthur went to keep the first aid kit while Sophia hurried up the stairs, but when she passed Emily, the latter grabbed her by the wrist and warned through gritted teeth. Stay away from my man if you don't want to end up in the sorriest circumstances known to man, Emily had said this so quietly that Sophia was the only one who could hear it, but the icy warning in her tone was not lost. It was only after Sophia was released from her grip that she hurried up the stairs, baffled by how much untoward hatred Emily had for her. She wanted to tell her that she was a natural klutz and had no intention whatsoever of seducing Arthur. Letting out an angry huff, Emily met Arthur at the bottom of the staircase and said, I don't think I can go back to sleep now. Stay up for a chat, Artie. I'm tired, Arthur said, handing her the bottle of milk he had taken from the fridge earlier. Here, you can have this. He hadn't actually been thirsty at all when he grabbed the milk. He had out of his bedroom when he heard gone footsteps coming down from the third floor, and as for the milk, it was nothing but chilled subterfuge. Emily was furious. So, Artie would rather rendezvous with the maid than stay up and talk to me. Is that it? Looks like I've severely underestimated how much Sophia means to him. The next morning, Anastasia woke up as the weak sunlight spilled into the room and over the side of the bed. Elliot had already called Larry, the vice president of Bourgeois, and asked him to drop by the house with a compilation of all the relevant company information. Over the phone, Elliot added that Anastasia would be in charge of running the business starting from today. Elliot had left for work after that, leaving Anastasia to wait for Larry's arrival at home. When the clock struck 10, Larry and his assistant were escorted into the living room by the maid. Larry glanced at the woman on the couch. She's blossomed into a whole new person now, one that must not be overlooked under any circumstances, he thought. He still remembered the days when she had started out in bourgeois. Elliot had asked him to persuade her to accept the gift of top-quality real estate and made him bring her the information on the property as well. However, completely unfazed by the otherwise tempting gift, Anastasia turned him down. From that moment onward, Larry had a feeling that she could very well become his superior. As it turned out, his gut had been right. Unlike the first few times they met, Anastasia looked wiser and more focused now, with a confidence that seemed to shine through, polished by years of experience. Vice President Young, it's been a while, she greeted with a smile. Mrs. Presgrave, I hope you've been well, Larry replied affably, acknowledging the difference in their positions now. You can always call me Anastasia, you know, Oh, no, I couldn't. I think Madam President has a nice ring to it, or maybe President Tillman, he said humorously. She did not try to dissuade him from addressing her as such. Could you give me a rundown of the business strategies for Bourgeois and the execution plans for them? I've only just taken over, and I'd really appreciate it if you could be my stalwart guide in company matters. Larry was more than happy to do so. After all, Anastasia was married to Elliot now, and under her leadership, Bourgeois was sure to reach new heights in the industry. Anastasia listened to what Larry had to say attentively. He was practically a veteran and a treasure trove of work experience, and she heartily approved of the strategies he had come up with for the business. We'll be holding a press conference for a new product launch soon, Madam President. You must make an appearance. It'll give the media a field day. Chapter 666 When is the press conference? Anastasia asked. Next Saturday, Larry replied dutifully. I'll be there, she promised with a nod. He beamed as he added, I'm sure the bourgeois team will be happy to have you at the helm of the business, she smiled. Well, in that case, I look forward to hearing more of your business strategies and having you show me the ropes, 
Vice President Young, while this was happening, Elliot was in his office at Pressgrave Group, sifting through the documents piled up on his desk when he came across a resume. He opened the folder and frowned slightly. It was Lorelai's resume, and she was applying not for an important position, but for an analyst job advertised by the finance department in one of his subsidiaries in the country. However, as it was against the rules to employ members of the Pressgrave's extended family, Elliot had no choice but to reject her job application. He decided that he would personally recommend her to some other company instead. Seeing the number she had written at the very top of her resume, he grabbed his phone and called her. Hello, Lorelai greeted on the other line. Hey, Lorelai, it's Elliot here. I just saw your resume and I believe an analyst job is far beneath your capabilities, he said in a gravelly tone. Lorelai said earnestly, Elliot, if you read my resume, you would know that I don't care about the job as much as I do about getting into your company. I can recommend you to another company that happens to be hiring. And I think you'd be a good fit for the job, Elliot said firmly. She paused for a few seconds before pressing, I'm actually in the area right now. Is it okay if I head to your office for a quick chat, Elliot? I don't think I've ever seen it in person before. Prepared to talk her into taking up the job at the other company, he replied, All right then. Come on over, they were family, after all, and he figured there was no harm in letting her up to his office for a brief, friendly conversation. Meanwhile, Lorelai was checking her reflection in the restroom mirror in one of the nearby cafes. She evaluated her face from all angles underneath the white light. When she was satisfied with the way she looked alongside her delicately applied makeup, she straightened her white blouse and her tight-fitting skirt, then flipped her long hair over her shoulders. For a finishing touch, she gave herself a light spritz of perfume and finally walked out. Subsequently, she pulled up outside the main entrance of Pressgrave Group. She was more than familiar with the company since her father had a friend who worked here as well. When she called the receptionist earlier, she made no mention of Elliot whatsoever. She went into the elevator, and the receptionist who escorted her left as soon as they reached the designated floor. Seeing this, Lorelai hurried into another available elevator and made her way up to the presidential office. Ray was already waiting for her, and when she arrived, he said, this way please, Miss Presgrave, Lorelai nodded and followed him into the spacious office, which she thought was only charming because of its owner. Elliot, she greeted warmly when she saw the man on the couch. Oh, good, you're here. Have a seat, Elliot said, gesturing toward the matching couch across from him. This place is humongous, and that view outside is absolutely stunning. She was never one to hold back on compliments, and the words flowed smoothly off her tongue as she flashed him a smile. Elliot handed her a docket of information and said, that's the financial company I was telling you about. The president happens to be a friend of mine. I already put in a word for you. And he said you could start working immediately without having to go through an interview. You pulled strings for me. Wow, I'm honored, she exclaimed. Taking the docket, she leafed through the company profile and the position they were offering her, then looked up with bright eyes as she asked, they're going to make me supervisor. He nodded. You're qualified for it. That's so nice of you to say, Lorelai said with a sweet smile, admiration glittering in her eyes. Elliot's gaze fell upon the document on the coffee table as he said, you can start work next Monday. Chapter 667 Seeing that you've done me such a huge favor, I don't see how I can turn down the offer, Elliot. It's so nice of you to put in a good word for me. Shall I buy you lunch as thanks for the recommendation? Lorelai asked, sliding the lunch invitation in as naturally as she could. Elliot wasted no time in rejecting her politely. No, thank you. I have something else planned for noon. Maybe next time. Well, when exactly is next time? She was not going to give up on spending time alone with him. It depends, he answered vaguely. He had no plans on accepting her gratitude. I'll let you know when I have the time, really? I'll hold you to that, she said cheerily, flirting subtly as she backed off. She knew that pressing him further would only irritate him, 
or worse, make him suspicious of her. Nevertheless, she did not leave the office after that and merely fanned herself so that the faint fragrance of her perfume would waft over in his direction. By the way, I'm a little parched from rushing over here. Could I have a cup of tea, please? Realizing this, he turned to address Ray, go fetch two cups of tea. When the assistant left the office, Lorelai rose from the couch and walked insouciantly over to the glass wall, basking herself in the afternoon sunlight that spilled generously into the office. She knew her years of toning her figure in the gym had rendered her completely irresistible to men, especially her cinched waist and her subtle curves which inspired most of their scandalous thoughts. If Elliot was looking at her, or even daring a glimpse, it would be more than enough for her. However, when she glanced into the reflection on the sparkling glass wall, she saw that he wasn't even looking in her direction. In fact, he had his head down as he flipped through work documents. The only thing that she saw on that glass was her own disappointment. She spun and returned to the couch, then picked up her cup of tea. Taking a sip, she asked, I'm not bothering you, am I Elliot? No, he replied distractedly as he glanced up at her, then signed the document with a flourish. I'll be taking my tea in a bit, he was just about to reach for his cup. When his phone rang, he took a look at the caller ID and smiled warmly. Knowing immediately who was on the other line, Lorelai pointed out hastily, is that Anastasia? Don't let her know I'm here. I don't want her getting the wrong idea, Elliot chuckled. Anastasia is better than that. Naturally, he did not plan on telling his wife about Lorelai's visit either. He picked up his phone and greeted in a voice like velvet, Hey, sweetheart, so I just had an informal meeting with Larry, and I told him to get an office ready for me. Guess we'll be going to work together from now on, honey. His eyes positively glimmered when he heard this, and he chortled as he said, You know what? I'll get him to set up an office right on my floor so that we can see each other all the time. Unfortunately, his suggestion was rejected by his wife, who countered, No, I don't want to be on the same stuffy floor as you. I want to have my own space on the same floor as Bourgeois. He was admittedly hurt, but he brushed it off and gave an exasperated laugh. All right, we'll do it your way, across from him. Lorelai held her teacup to her lips and glanced at the man who was standing by the glass wall. She took in the sharp lines of his silhouette longingly, and her heart twisted with bitter jealousy when she heard the gentle way he spoke to Anastasia. She had not seen him for close to a dozen years, but his figure was imprinted in the back of her mind, and she never forgot him even though her father had forced her to stay abroad for years. If it weren't for her father, she would have returned to Elliot's side years ago. Alas, fate had a cruel sense of humor, for her existence got in the way of her father stealing the Presgrave family fortune. She never even got the chance to tell Elliot of her feelings for him, and all this while, she remembered him as the boy next door who had sent her heart racing since they were children. She could still remember how they used to run around the Presgrave residence gardens together, and how he would take her hand to help her to her feet whenever she fell. He would comfort her when she cried, and stand up for her when she broke a vase or two. He was the only religion she ever knew as a child, the one person she wanted to devote herself to on a daily basis. But the universe clearly hated her, because by the time she saw him again after all her years abroad, he was already married with a kid, and he had become devastatingly handsome, more so than she remembered. Yes, I promise I'll take a break when I need to and that I won't be a workaholic, Elliot murmured into the phone with a lovesick grin on his face. He then went on to ask about her morning, and after reminding her to keep warm during her time of the month as well as exchanging sweet nonsense with her, he hung up reluctantly. He turned around, and he seemed surprised to see that Lorelai was still there. Following, he walked over to the couch and took his seat. So, it was Anastasia after all. You're so lucky to have found a wife like her. She's wonderful, Lorelai praised with a smile. There was a bright gleam in Elliot's eyes as well as he said, she's the best. I'm telling you, I don't know what I did to deserve someone like her. 
Chapter 668 The childhood memories flitted through Lorelai's mind like scenes from some old movie, emboldening her. Hence, she couldn't help bringing them up as she asked, Elliot, do you still remember the time when I broke the vase in your family home? I think I was about eight at the time, and I was so scared I couldn't stop shaking. You were the one who took the blame for me, and I managed to get off without punishment. Elliot was a little taken aback by this as he asked, I did that? Huh. I totally forgot about it. Her lips curled up in a smile. Well, I still remember, because those are the happiest moments of my childhood. They say that a happy childhood is a soothing balm to the pains of growing up, you know. So, I guess I should thank you for giving me some of the best childhood memories. She looked up at him after finishing her sentence and her gaze lingered on the features that she so adored. Hearing what she said, Elliot gave her a perfunctory smile. Did you have a good time abroad? I suppose I did, though I was a little lonely, she admitted with a sigh. If I ever come across someone suitable, I'd be sure to send them your way, she feigned embarrassment as she mumbled, you don't even know my type, oh, that's right, he said. Come on, tell me, he wanted to know what he should look out for if he wanted to set her up with someone. She narrowed her eyes as if in thought. A sweet smile broke over her face as she gazed at him and said, I'm not asking for much. I want someone as handsome and capable as you. Elliot's instincts were sharp to begin with, and he could sense that the admiration she had for him was beyond platonic the moment he saw the smoldering gleam in her eyes. If he were any other man, he might find her love for him a triumph, something to gloat about to his peers. But he was not such a man, and her unsolicited affections only served to push him away. He eyed her sullenly as he said, Lorelai, I do not wish to hear such things again. Anastasia is the only woman for me, and nothing will ever change. He ended his sentence calmly, but there was no hiding the dangerous warning that belied his words. At once, Lorelai bristled and quickly explained, I think you're getting the wrong idea here, Elliot. I'm not trying to come between you and your wife. You're like a baby sister to me. Always have been, always will be, he continued while his gaze darkened. At some point, it was like staring into the icy depths of some pitch-black abyss. A chill ran down her spine when she heard this. More than anything, she was surprised to be rejected by him. I'm sorry if I cracked a joke and it went too far. Elliot. I guess I thought it was okay for me to say something like that because of how much we used to hang out as children, she apologized lamely, attempting to salvage the situation. However, Elliot did not bother letting her continue with her explanation, be it true or false. I have a meeting to get to, so you should go. With that, he picked up the documents he had signed earlier and walked back to his desk. Lorelai, on the other hand, rose in a daze and said slowly, I'll get going now then. Goodbye, Elliot. When she was out of the office, she clutched the front of her shirt and stared into space helplessly. She never imagined him to be so loyal to his marriage, much less so protective over his wife. This could become a hurdle to her father's plans, but she figured this hiccup was only due to the fact that Elliot was newly married. At some point, he would grow weary of Anastasia and begin to resent her for chaining him to a miserable marriage. If Kendra's advice was anything to go by, he would start feeling that way around the time Anastasia fell pregnant again, and that would be Lorelai's window of opportunity. Meanwhile, a fleet of cars was passing through the fields in the countryside, cruising down the road that led into the woods in the distance. Sophia was in the back seat of the second car in the fleet, and after taking a short nap, she woke up only to find that she was surrounded by acres and acres of farmland. As such, she rested her arms on the edge of the car window and peered out of the glass at the idyllic scenery. Arthur was going to evaluate a place that was famed for its serenity, and he had brought along with him a renowned medium. It was around noon when they arrived at a restaurant that looked heavily outback-inspired. The four cars of the fleet pulled into the parking lot after Arthur decided that they were going to have to settle for lunch here. They had driven close to 50 miles out of the city, and as things were, 
it was impossible for them to find a decent restaurant in that area, much less high-end dining establishments. When the second car rolled to a stop, Sophia happily got down from the vehicle. She was just about to stretch to loosen her joints when suddenly, a large and aggressive dog came rushing out of the doghouse on the premises and began barking ferociously at them. Being the closest one to the dog, Sophia visibly blanched, and fear made her seek out the person most likely to protect her. Without a word, she instinctively lashed herself onto said person and clung to him for dear life. Chapter 669 Just like that, the young, handsome, and muscular bodyguard became Sophia's shield. She clung to him like an octopus as she yowled. Ah, save me. Her bodyguard carried her into his arms while kicking the dog in the snout as the animal reached her. The pain sent it running back to its den and hiding from them. Getting out of the first car, Arthur narrowed his eyes at the sight. As someone well attuned with his surroundings, the bodyguard soon noticed Arthur and hurriedly lowered Sophia down. It's over now, Miss Goodwin. Thank you, sir. She grinned at him with gratitude evident in her eyes. You are welcome, he stiffly replied, looking down at his feet in fear. She shyly glanced at the bodyguard's face. She had noticed this man for a while now. He was the youngest of Arthur's men, and despite being of a mixed race descent, he spoke fluent English. Whenever he was at work with an earpiece on, he looked so very handsome. When Arthur saw the admiring look in her eyes, he tuned out the fortune teller standing beside him. Did Sophia have a crush on his bodyguard? Stepping out of the third car, Emily elegantly sashayed over to Arthur. Are we having lunch here, Artie? It was obvious from her tone that she did not want to dine here since this place was below her station. Furthermore, the ground was so filthy that just standing there had sullied her exquisite shoes. I'm so sorry about that. Did it hurt you? The friendly owner of the shop came rushing over to welcome them. Are you dining here? Oh, yes. Sophia answered with a smile. When she later saw the bodyguards dining outside while Arthur and the others headed into a private room, she said to him, I'll be dining outside, Mr. Weiss. She wanted to dine with the handsome bodyguard, after all. We will dine together, Arthur replied. Artie, she's just a servant, Emily protested. Let her dine outside with the bodyguards. Miss Jennings is right, Sophia said in agreement. I'll take my leave now. She then walked over to the table with the handsome bodyguard and sat down by his side. Emily linked her arm through Arthur's and led him into the private dining room. As the place was not busy, their food had arrived quickly. Sophia's head spun when she saw just how fast and quietly the men ate. In around ten minutes, everyone was done eating. Take your time, Miss Goodwin, said the bodyguard sitting beside her. Are you guys done? We're all done eating, he replied before heading outside with the rest of his co-workers to keep guard. With a resigned sigh, she pulled out her phone and began eating while scrolling through the news. Meanwhile, inside the private room, the fortune teller was continuing about the complexities of his field. Arthur solemnly listened to every word being said, but Emily was bored out of her mind as she had no interest at all in fortune-telling. Finally, they returned to the cars. When Sophia saw that the bodyguard she had a crush on was opening the door for her, she felt happy. However, just as they were about to leave, Sophia's car suddenly halted. The door to the back of the car was open to allow Arthur to enter. She was shocked. Arthur was meant to share a car with the fortune teller, right? Why was he here? Chapter 670 As soon as Arthur entered the car, the bodyguard driving immediately sat up straight and put on a serious face. Meanwhile, Emily, who had seen Arthur getting into Sophia's car, was seething. It was too bad that the cars had already started moving. Otherwise, she would have demanded he move to her car instead. After entering the car, Arthur closed his eyes as though he was going to take a nap. The afternoon sun splayed across his face, emphasizing the elegant and refined features of his handsome face. He did not say a single word which caused the air inside the car to feel awkward and heavy. Everyone could feel an immense yet silent pressure bearing down on them. All giddy joy had fled Sophia's mind. Why was he even here? After half an hour of driving, 
they finally arrived at a dense forest. The remaining parts of their journey would lead them along dirt paths instead of paved roads so the ride turned bumpy. Large trees lined both sides of the road, providing them shade and turning the summer heat into a breezy spring air. With the fortune teller leading the way, the train of cars successfully navigated through the mountain roads ahead of them. Sophia's heart was pounding the entire time. When the slope reached nearly 60 degrees, her hand flung out to grasp at another arm in panic. That arm belonged to Arthur. It's going to be fine, he said when he saw how pale she was. Are we still going up? She was beyond herself with fear. Just then, the SUVs pulled to a stop on a grassy plain that was flat and even. Emily immediately dashed out of her car and fell to her knees as she began puking. She had been raised in luxury. The ride up the mountains had been extremely hard for her to stomach. Out of the kindness of her heart, Sophia handed her some tissues. Are you okay, Miss Jennings? Although Emily accepted the offered tissue, she still shot Sophia a glare. Was Sophia laughing at her? Young Master Weiss, we will need to walk for a while longer before we arrive at our destination. What? We still have to walk. Emily loudly protested. Why did she come along? All she got was pain and suffering. How long do we have to walk? About 20 minutes or so, replied the fortune teller. Rest in the car, Arthur said to Emily. He then glanced at Sophia. Can you walk? Not wanting to stay behind to be at Emily's beck and call, she hurriedly nodded. Yes, I am fine with walking. Do not go. Sophia, stay with me, Emily suddenly said. She would not give Sophia any chance to go on a stroll with Arthur. She had to split them up. Alistair, Arthur said, pointing to the young bodyguard Sophia had a crush on, you'll be staying behind to take care of Miss Jennings. Yes, sir, replied Alistair with a nod. In that case, I'm going with you too, Emily spat out through gritted teeth, filled to the brim with frustration. However, as soon as she said that, she began vomiting once more. We have a tough climb ahead of us. You should rest here instead. Arthur then walked away toward the path that spiraled up the mountain. Disappointment flickered through Sophia's heart. She was hoping Alistair would be hiking with them. Four of the bodyguards followed them up the mountain, while the remaining two stayed behind to stand guard. As Arthur was dressed in a black athletic outfit with a pair of silver sunglasses perched on his nose, his image of a refined young man remained strong, even deep in the mountains. Sophia was also dressed in a set of athletic clothing with shoes suited for hiking, but the following hike was still hard for her. There was only a tiny path that meandered through the woods. When they arrived at a slope that was slippery due to the rain, Arthur's long legs carried him safely upward, while Sophia had to attempt the climb with the help of the branches around her. Just then, a fair hand was held out before her. She looked up only to see that it was Arthur who was offering to pull her up. There was a moment of hesitation before she accepted the offer. The moment she placed her hand in his, she was dragged up the slope by a strong burst of force. Ah, she wrapped her arms tight around his waist, afraid to fall while she tried to balance herself. I'm sorry. Afraid that she had offended him, she hurriedly stepped back as soon as she regained her balance. Chapter 671 Arthur turned around and continued to climb up without saying a single word. Unwilling to trouble him further, Sophia cautiously followed after him. Slowly, her mind drifted. She rarely had the time to go hiking. The distant mountains, covered by a hazy layer of cloud and light, filled her heart with wonder. It was a nice feeling. Bang! Distracted by the scenery, she walked into Arthur. When she realized she had bumped into him again, she blushed. The bodyguards who had been following behind them stared at them in disbelief. No one was ever allowed to be so rude to young Master Weiss. Just how did this girl do it? What gave her the courage to constantly annoy him? If Sophia could read minds and knew what the bodyguards were thinking, she would have the urge to bury herself alive. She was not trying to annoy him. We'll have a better view once we're at the peak. Let us keep moving, Mr. Weiss, said the fortune teller. Arthur nodded. 
There was no way he would cut corners when it came to selecting a spot for his grandfather's grave. He then turned to glance at Sophia as if he were worried that she could not continue the climb. Don't worry, I can keep going, she hurriedly said when she saw the look in his eyes. The group gradually made their way to the peak of the mountain. Whenever she needed help, Arthur would always turn around to give her a hand. Even though there were four burly men right behind her, Arthur still persisted in helping her. The peak of the mountain was a flat, grassy field with no trees to be seen. The field of grass stretching far into the horizon made it seem like they were closer to the sky. The fortune teller began rattling off calculations based on the complex formulas of his profession. While Sophia was left confused by his words, Arthur nodded along as if he understood what was being said. That surprised her. Had Arthur learned how to tell fortunes just from reading books on the subject over the past few days? No way. Just how strong of a learner was he? The fortune teller pointed to a spot halfway up a mountain. Young master, that is the spot I have selected for your grandfather. It is surrounded by mountains, which means he would be surrounded by protectors. It is a great spot. Arthur stared at the spot being pointed at. It had a great view while being surrounded on all sides by mountains. There was nothing that loomed over it, which meant there was no weird imbalance. It was certainly a good spot. He had planned to purchase the entire mountain as his grandfather's eternal resting place if he could find a good spot. The mountain peak was covered in grass that came up to their knees. It was an incredible sight to behold. Standing beside him, Sophia solemnly listened to the lecture on fortune-telling. The fortune-teller began walking in excitement with Arthur following behind him. Enthralled by the lecture, she followed after them. The fortune-teller came to a stop. Suddenly, something near her began wriggling, startling her. It was a sunbathing snake that was currently licking the air in her direction while rearing up as if to attack her. Ah, when she saw the snake, she hurriedly darted to the side. However, a greater danger awaited her, for she had lost her balance and was about to roll off the side of the mountain. Sophia, as the person standing closest to her, Arthur moved to catch her. In doing so, he lost his balance as well. Sir, the bodyguards charged over. It was too late. They watched as Arthur and Sophia rolled across the grass and over the side of the mountain. All Sophia knew was that she was being held in a tight embrace while her face was pressed hard against Arthur's muscular chest. Despite rolling down the hill, he did not let her go at all. Thankfully, they soon arrived at a flat piece of land that stopped their descent. The moment they stopped rolling, she pulled her face away from his chest. Her nostrils were filled with his cedar-scented cologne and the smell of grass. She looked up to find that he was bleeding from a cut on his forehead while she had come out of the experience unscathed. Chapter 672 You're hurt. Sophia hurriedly got off of Arthur. They were both covered in dirt and grass. The bodyguards leaped down to them, and two of them helped Arthur up to his feet. Are you all right, sir? He was feeling fine, other than the cut on his forehead that had been caused by a sharp tree branch and the various scrapes that littered his hands. I'm fine, he dusted himself off before turning to look at her. Did the snake bite you? No, it didn't, she shook her head. Her face was still stark white from shock. As they climbed back up to the peak, her gaze remained fixed on him. Her heart was pounding. When they rolled down the side of the hill, he had wrapped an arm tightly around her waist while his other hand pressed her head against his chest. He had done it just to ensure she would not be injured. However, that meant he was unable to protect himself during the fall. Her blood was rushing. The high and mighty young master had actually risked himself to protect her. What if she had fallen off a high cliff instead? From how tightly he had wrapped himself around her, would he fall with her as well? The bodyguards pulled out a first aid kit, then cleaned and dressed the bleeding cut on Arthur's forehead. The fortune teller was scared out of his wits by the dangerous situation Arthur had placed himself in. Are you all right, young Master Weiss? I'm fine. Continue, Arthur said with a wave of his hand. His bodyguards spread out around them, area sweeping the for any signs of snakes. Even Sophia was starting to feel afraid of the grass around her. 
That snake had been the longest snake she had ever seen in her life. By the time the fortune teller was done with his analysis, Arthur had his men take photos of the area instead of making a decision right then and there. He would decide after thoroughly researching the area. Hiking up a mountain was always easier than hiking down a mountain. It was a steep climb, which meant their descent was harder. One false move and they would go rolling down the mountain. With bent legs, she slowly shuffled down the mountain while clinging to the surrounding branches. Her hand reached for the next branch, only to grab a long leaf instead. Suddenly, pain shot through her hand as the sharp edges of the leaf slashed her hand. She let out a sharp hiss, pulling her hand back to inspect it. It was bleeding. Arthur was right behind her. He frowned and said, let me see. She showed him her palm. Be careful, he said as he inspected her hand. Avoid touching leaves similar to this, she nodded in response. He then moved to walk in front of her. When they reached a tough part of the climb, he would turn around and give her a hand. Every time that happened, she would notice the wounds on his fair hands, making her heart throb in pain. Young Master Wise, please don't save me from danger next time, she said. Why? He turned around and stared into her eyes. I'm afraid you will be injured. I do not want you to get hurt because of me. She solemnly stared back at him. I'm a lucky man. I won't die. He turned his attention back to climbing down the mountain. They soon arrived at another steep section. Just as she was cautiously making her way down, he suddenly lifted her up horizontally since he was already on a safe, flat spot. Her mind was stuck in a dazed state, and she only snapped back to her senses when she was finally put down. Arthur had carried her. Finally, they were back on the dirt path they had initially followed and had safely made it back to the cars. Emily had been waiting for their return. By the time they did, the sun was about to set. After all, it was well past five o'clock. Artie, she happily dashed over to the group but stopped when she saw the wound on Arthur's forehead. How did you get hurt? She asked, upset. I'm fine. I was accidentally cut by a branch. He calmly explained. She looked him up and down. His black outfit was covered in bits of grass, as if he had been rolling on the ground. Chapter 673 Your hands. How did you hurt your hands? Emily let out a painful shriek when she saw the scrapes on Arthur's hands. Meanwhile, Sophia lowered her head. After all, he was only hurt because of her. It's nothing. We'll deal with it when we get back. Arthur then led Emily back to the car. As she got in, she said, Artie, I want to ride in the same car as you. I'm covered with dirt. He merely replied before closing the door in her face. She then watched as he turned to the second car of the group and joined Sophia in her car. Her eyes were blazing with rage. Was a simple maid better than her now? They started on the journey back. Sophia could not handle it any longer. Driving downhill was even more frightful than their ride up. She clutched tightly to the handlebars in the car and looked away from the road ahead. On the other hand, Arthur was as calm as one could be. He had the utmost faith in his bodyguard's driving skills. Once the cars were finally back on smooth, paved roads, they sped off toward the city like horses dashing through the night. It was dark outside by now. After an eventful day, Sophia was exhausted. Even though Arthur was sitting right beside her, she could not help but fall asleep. While she was dozing off, her head lolled to the side and leaned against his shoulder. Instead of pushing her away, he just let her be. She spent the entire journey back sleeping. By the time they arrived back at the mansion, it was around seven o'clock. Someone gently patted her cheeks. We're home, Sophia. She opened her eyes and blinked away her drowsiness. When she realized she had been sleeping against his shoulder, she immediately sat up straight. Goodness, had she spent the entire journey sleeping on Arthur's shoulder? Emily's two maids immediately came to greet them. As they stepped through the doors, Arthur instantly went up to his room for a shower. Sophia was about to do the same when Emily called out for her to stop. Her sharp gaze scanned her. With the help of the room's lights, she could see the dirt and grass sticking to Sophia's outfit. Sophia, just how did Artie get hurt? She suspiciously asked. Sophia stared back, stunned. 
I will not be merciful if you lie to me, Emily threatened. I was nearly bitten by a snake when we were at the peak, and I lost my balance. Young Master Weiss fell down the side of the mountain with me as he wanted to protect me, Sophia bluntly answered. She had not planned to lie anyway. Emily's eyes went wide. She could imagine exactly what had happened. Jealousy roared through her as she scoffed. Are you sure you did not intentionally lose your balance so that Arctic would hold you in his arms and roll down the mountain with you? You sure are doing a lot just to seduce him. You would do anything, wouldn't you? I, just as Sophia was about to speak, Emily slapped her across the face and shouted, the nerve of you to assume you deserve Artie risking his life over. Take the slap as your warning, Sophia's head had turned away from the force of the slap. There was a loud humming noise echoing in her ears. However, she still managed to hear a man's voice barking out, Stop it, Emily. Arthur had come back down when he heard the commotion. He moved to stand between them. You are not allowed to hit her, Artie. She nearly killed you. It was just a lesson. Emily did not think she did anything wrong. In her mind, Sophia had to be reminded of her place. A maid did not deserve to be protected by Arthur Weiss. Enough. You do not have the right to hit her, he coldly said. He then turned around to look at Sophia. When he saw the bright red mark on her skin, he frowned. Head on upstairs and shower, Sophia moved to do as she was ordered. Artie, do you know how worried I was about you? Emily cried out, tears in her eyes. You must be tired as well. Get some rest, he said with a frown. Emily sniffled. You should have let her roll down the mountain by herself. You did not need to protect her. After all, you are an important person. Chapter 674 Get me an ice pack, Arthur said to the nearby maids, ignoring Emily. No, you cannot, hate flashed across Emily's eyes. In response, the maids merely remained where they were. Do your job, Arthur commanded as his eyes darkened. There was no way any of them would dare go against a direct order from him. After all, they knew who the true person in charge was. They hurriedly handed him an ice pack and a clean hand towel. He then headed upstairs with those items in hand. Meanwhile, Emily was gnashing her teeth. She was certain this was all just one of Sophia's ploys to seduce Arthur. No way. The only person allowed to be Mrs. Weiss was her. No one could steal the title away from her. Sitting down on the bed, Sophia gingerly touched her swollen cheek. Pain flared up at the slightest touch. Just then, she heard footsteps coming toward her room. When she looked up to find Arthur entering her room, she quickly turned away to hide her swollen cheek. He thrust a towel, wrapped ice pack into her view. Hold it against your cheek, she took the ice pack and held it against her cheek. She let out a hiss at the sensation before looking up at him and saying, She's right. What? Do you not know how to fight back when you are hit? There was a weird mocking tone in his voice. He moved to sit down on the chair opposite her. It's not that. Of course, it is not right for her to hit other people. I meant to say that she was right in telling you to not save me when I am in danger, she clarified. Why? He frowned. I had only rolled down a gentle slope today, but what if I had fallen off a high cliff? She sighed. Hence, when you saved me, I was scared. What if you were seriously hurt? He had to admit that she had a great imagination. Still, she was right. If he died trying to save her, he would have lost everything. Even so, upon closer inspection of his feelings, he realized he had never once wondered if he should save her. He had gone to save her without hesitating at all. It was just like when she nearly drowned in the sea. He had raced toward her without hesitation and offered any help he could provide. Frankly speaking, even he found his behavior odd. He was someone who cherished life, so why did he risk his lifetime and time again for Sophia? When he eventually left the room, Sophia received a call from her mother. Her father had gotten into a car crash that morning and was hospitalized for some broken bones. She swiftly headed to Arthur's room, making her way in without even asking for permission. Behind the door stood Arthur, who was only dressed in his underwear while still dripping wet from his shower. He had been planning to put on some proper pants when the door opened. Startled, 
he swiftly grabbed his towel and hastily wrapped it around his waist to cover his crotch. Who said you could come in? When she realized what she had walked in on, she hurriedly turned away. Even so, she still saw a glimpse of his black underwear. With a blush burning on her cheeks, she replied, I'm truly sorry, young Master Weiss. I did not mean to do this, he thought she was doing it intentionally though. He picked up another towel to dry his hair with before sitting on the couch. He turned around to stare at Emily while his body remained half naked. I got a call from my mother. My dad was in a car crash and some of his bones were broken. I want to go home to visit him. She turned to look at him with pleading eyes. He stroked his chin, showcasing his jawline as he did so. How many days? He asked. Three days. I just need three days. After all, she did not dare go overboard with its finances. Okay, come back to me in exactly three days. If you dare dilly-dally or forget to come back, there will be consequences. His lips curled up in an obvious warning. Her heart was racing fast. She never thought of running anyway. She carried her belongings back downstairs when Emily stopped her from leaving. No one said you could leave, she said. Excuse me, but I have some urgent family business, Sophia politely replied. Chapter 675 Artie's family will be back in one month, Sophia. His grandmother would never allow a scheming woman near him. You had better leave on your own violation while you still can, Emily coldly sneered. However, her warning did not matter to Sophia at all since she had no plans to get anything from Arthur. The only thing she could ever want from him was his forgiveness. She would be immensely grateful if Arthur could forgive and forget. No need to worry, Miss Jennings. I do not have any schemes for young Master Wise, Sophia solemnly replied. Emily scoffed. Do you think your innocent face can hide your thoughts? I have already reported to old Madame Presgrave about your schemes on Artie. Just you wait, you'll be in for a bad time. By now, Sophia had lost all patience with this conversation. She rushed out the door, worried about her father. At the hospital, Drake Goodwin was in bed while his wife sat next to him. One of his legs was trapped in a cast. How are you doing, Dad? Is it very serious? It's not that bad. I just need to rest for a month or two. Say, what have you been doing lately? Young Master Weiss did not make life hard for you, did he? Tiana worriedly scanned her daughter up and down. She was relieved to find that Sophia had gained weight. I'm fine, Mom. I have been looking for that necklace with him, Sophia replied in a placating tone. In reality, Drake and Tiana were not doing well. They spent their days worrying as Drake had lost his company and owed a huge debt to the banks. However, they did not dare tell their daughter any of their woes. Without the company's dividends, the loan repayments were making life extremely hard for them. Pressgrave Residence It was Anastasia and Elliot's first meal home after the wedding. Now that Harriet was an old woman, she discovered her liking for a lively environment. After dinner, Anastasia took a stroll under the stars with Elliot. With the moon shining brightly down on their winding path through the woods, they felt an unprecedented joy. He tightly linked his fingers with hers, as if she would disappear if he ever let go of her hand. After the wedding, he realized there was an even more beautiful and genteel aura that hung around her. The more he looked at her, the more enthralled he was. Thank goodness she was his now. She belonged only to him. Sweetheart, he pulled her into an embrace. Hum, when she looked up at him, she felt a kiss on her forehead. She smiled and gazed deep into his eyes where she could see all the love he held. For her, a chew. Suddenly, she sneezed. He immediately took off his jacket and wrapped it around her. Don't catch a cold, she chuckled. I'm happy, even if I fall sick. That way, I can enjoy being taken care of by you. He let out a huff of exasperation and tapped her on the tip of her nose. Don't say that. They hugged each other for a while longer before the love in their eyes was slowly tainted by lust. I asked Nigel to take care of Jared for tonight, he rasped. Naturally, Anastasia knew what Elliot meant by that. Is that really okay? She shyly asked. It's the weekend tomorrow. We can sleep in, he smiled. As planned, 
Jared stayed the night with Nigel while Elliot's black Bugatti sports car raced back to their home. Under the moonlight, the mansion glimmered with beauty. The lighting only ever made it seem grander and more mysterious. He pulled to a stop in the underground garage, opened the door, and led Anastasia into the lift. The entire villa was so quiet that their whispers echoed through the air as they listened to each other's heartbeats. When they arrived on the third floor, he swept her off her feet and carried her to bed. The embers that sparked a life during their stroll through the woods were still burning bright. If she did not help him put the fire out, he would be blazing with lust throughout the night. The night eventually passed on and the morning soon came. Chapter 676 Anastasia was woken up by her internal alarm clock. She decided to cook some breakfast for Elliot. It had been a while since she was able to show off her cooking skills since they had servants. Thankfully, she was still skilled enough to cook up two hot bowls of noodles. The fragrant scent combined with poached eggs and slices of beef made the food seem even more delicious. She even took a photo of it and uploaded it to her social media accounts with the caption, Breakfast with Mr. Pressgrave. Their morning had started now. Soon, Elliot arrived at the dining room. He had just taken a shower after his usual morning exercise. Dressed in loungewear, he was a walking hormone, yet he was oblivious to how attractive he was. She knew that the more she stared at him, the better her sense of beauty would be. In fact, if she ever divorced him, she might not be able to marry again. After all, Elliot was going to make her picky. Thus, she would do her best as Mrs. Pressgrave. What an amazing wife I have, he praised. Do you only know that now? She giggled. No, I knew about it from the start. That is why I am so very lucky to have married you. All of the sweet nothings being spoken that morning was going to rot her teeth one day. With a chuckle, she pushed his bowl of noodles over to him. Eat up. After breakfast, she read up on the news. What she saw made her guffaw. Her post from that morning was currently trending. The cooking skills of rich madams exposed was the headline. Now that she thought about it, she could no longer post whatever she wanted on her social media accounts now. She had to keep a low profile. Perhaps she should set her post privacy to only me. Anastasia had a new product launch party to attend at Bourgeois that afternoon. As a certain someone had nothing to do, she decided to attend with the best accessory anyone could ever have her husband. The launch party would be held in an event hall owned by Pressgrave Group. Several top-tier celebrities and socialites had been invited, and there would be a fashion runway on which the atelier was going to be live-streamed. When two o'clock rolled around, people began to show up at the venue. There was an order to everything as the paparazzi all showed up with their cameras and streaming equipment. Larry then received a call that made him drop all work and wait by the front gates. A Rolls Royce pulled up, and out walked a couple whom Larry happily greeted, President Pressgrave, Mrs. Pressgrave, you're here, you've worked hard, Mr. Young, Anastasia smiled. No, no, I'm only doing my job, with a wave of his hand, Larry gestured for them to head inside. He then led them to the front row. It was then that Larry leaned down to whisper into Anastasia's ear, we would need you to make a speech later, Mrs. Pressgrave, she was stunned. Next time, she said with a wave of her hand. She had not come prepared. Today, I am only here to admire the works. Very well. Larry would never force anyone to do something they did not want to do. Just then, someone walked over to them. It was Mason. President Pressgrave, Mrs. Pressgrave, Mason greeted with a smile. There's no need to be so formal, Mason. Just call me Anastasia. Mason could not do that. According to what he knew now, Anastasia was the new CEO of Bourgeois. There was no way he would dare go against societal rules. Soon, the various celebrities who had been invited greeted the people around them. None of them would dare to provide their benefactors with inferior service. Every lady present that night had dressed themselves up. However, none of them would dare start up a fuss while Anastasia was standing right there. Still, there were a lot of secretive looks and poses meant to attract Elliot's attention. Later that evening, one of the fashion catwalk models, Katrina, walked over to them. Mason's efforts had allowed her modeling company 
to take charge of the fashion runway. When Katrina saw Elliot, she was internally jumping with glee. From then on, she could be found primping before every mirror available to her. Furthermore, there was going to be a new spokesperson recruitment program happening after the launch. As an ambitious woman, Katrina wanted the chance to be bourgeois spokesperson. Chapter 677 Anastasia walked backstage to greet Felicia. After all, Felicia and her design team were the stars of the product launch party. Your designs are so beautiful this time, Felicia, Anastasia commented as she flipped through the art book. Everything in there was well designed. I hope we didn't disappoint you, in Felicia's mind Anastasia was the boss. I believe in you, Felicia, Anastasia, suddenly, a lady called out from behind them before Katrina swiftly moved to stand behind Anastasia. Katrina, Anastasia greeted with a smile. Do you mind if we talk in private? Katrina nervously asked. She currently found it hard to talk to Anastasia because she exuded an oppressive pressure that Katrina did not like. Felicia gently patted Anastasia on the cheeks. I'll help the team out now, Anastasia. The moment Felicia was gone, Katrina took a deep breath. I know Bourgeois is looking for a spokesperson for their product. I was hoping I could have a chance. To be in your advertisements, that is up to marketing. You can attend the interviews for the job, Anastasia smiled. Katrina bit her lip. Anastasia, can you make an exception for me just this once, please? My brother helped you all those years, after all, naturally, Anastasia knew exactly what Katrina was thinking. The woman wanted compensation for Mason's help all those years and if the one making the request had been Mason, she would have gone along with the plan before asking about why. When Anastasia remained silent, Katrina continued, I know I should not be greedy and take advantage of something owed to someone else, but we are like a family. Can't you make an exception? Anastasia knew that Mason was not someone to ask for reparations either. I'll have to ask the team about it. I'll let you know when I have news. Thank you, Anastasia. Katrina smiled. When Anastasia left, she let out a sigh of relief. Her brother would not ask for anything in return because he was a proud man, but she was not like him. She would use anything she could to help herself since she was not doing well as a model. If she wanted to become a celebrity, she would have to be famous first. When Anastasia returned to her seat, Elliot was chatting with Larry, who then stood up the moment he noticed her return. The show started the moment she returned. Lights beamed down onto the stage as masked models strutted while decked out in jewelry made by bourgeois. Naturally, Katrina was one of the models. She had all her attention focused on doing the best she could. However, when she walked by, she would stare at Elliot. Anastasia noticed it, of course. She knew what kind of woman Katrina was. As long as there was an opportunity, Katrina would do anything to seduce someone. Before the show, Anastasia had been contemplating giving her a chance because of her connection to Mason. Now, however, all of those thoughts had been chucked out of the window. I have to answer a call, sweetheart, Elliot softly said. She merely nodded in response as she was engrossed in the show. Then, just as he stood up, one of the female celebrities stood up as well. Although she left in the opposite direction, the corridors outside the hall were all interconnected. That celebrity had been waiting for her chance. Using the excuse that she had to head to the bathroom, she walked out of the hall. When she eventually made her way over to the other side, she saw Elliot taking a phone call while standing in front of the floor-to-ceiling window. Elliot was like a magnet that attracted the gaze of every woman present that evening. No matter where he stood, he would become the center of attention. After all, he was a man whom people rarely saw. Any woman with brain cells would know not to waste any opportunity that came along. The celebrity's name was Catherine Windsor. She was considered one of the most popular celebrities of the year. Due to a popular show that had recently aired, due to her fame, she had recently been announced as the spokesperson for bourgeois new products. However, her ambitions did not end there. She wanted a strong and powerful benefactor, someone like Elliot Pergrave, who stood at the top of the food chain. Elliot ended the call and turned to return to the event hall. At the same time, 
she pretended to be busy talking on the phone and acted as if she did not see him there. When she crashed into him, he reached a hand out to her shoulder to stop her from falling to the ground. Chapter 678 Catherine hastily apologized, I'm sorry. President Pressgrave, I didn't see you there, this is all my fault. She then reached out and patted his arm. I hope I didn't hurt you. Elliot waved his hand and answered, It's fine, oh, sorry about the lipstick stain on your suit. Let me take care of it. Rather than removing the stain off his arm, she tried to reach out to stroke his chest after saying that. His arm prevented her attempt right away, need, and he said in an icy tone, No Catherine let out a frustrated sigh as soon as Elliot walked away. She saw this as an opportunity to stimulate his interest in her. No one could approach him because he behaved in a way that was true with what she had heard about him. Why was he married if he didn't like women? Right after Catherine left, Felica came out from around the corner. She had just come out from the bathroom when she saw the scene, and she thought it would taint her sight for the day. She wasn't often the kind to pry into other people's business, but she felt it was necessary to alert Anastasia about this. If an actress went out of her way to try to seduce Elliot, then she was not the best choice to represent Bourgeois as a spokesperson. Anastasia's phone lit up with texts. She checked it and saw it was a text message from Felicia. I just saw Catherine trying to flirt with your husband in the hallway, Anastasia. You should take note. She read the text calmly and her eyes went to where Catherine should have been. There was no one there. Thank you, Felicia, Anastasia replied graciously. At this moment, Elliot had returned and his large hand went out to grasp hers with the intention to caress it. She then raised her head to meet his gaze. Despite the dim lighting, the man's eyes gleamed with affection. When she noticed this, she smiled sweetly and kissed his cheek, showing her affection in public. Catherine happened to see their affections. As she was going back to her seat, she started to feel a little scared as she thought about the foolish thing she had just done. She was worried that Anastasia wouldn't let her off the hook if she knew about the flirting earlier. She was glad Anastasia didn't know about it. Who would know what Anastasia knew though? When Elliot saw just how bold she was to kiss him in public like this, he gave her a contented smile that made her heart flutter. Her face started to blush as she felt the gazes of everyone on them. Her confession of love for this man was publicized. This was a warning for anyone who wanted to take him away from her. The press conference went smoothly while the online media reaction was spectacular. A great deal of support and encouragement was shown to them with some exceptional items being promoted as well. After they left the conference, Elliot took her to a posh restaurant for dinner. Tonight was the night of their date. In addition to that, he had another surprise in store for her. He was pleased to get the most beautiful brooch that was being offered at the event, and he planned to give it to her as a present tonight. Oh, when did you get this? Anastasia was a little surprised, but she was excited that he had just given her something out of the blue. It looks good on you, he told her, praising both the brooch and her. Anastasia took the gift as Elliot placed his chin on his folded palms and looked at her affectionately. Since you accepted my gift, Mrs. Pressgrave has to reward me tonight. Oh, so, there is a secret motive here. Anastasia's eyes narrowed as she said, I think I need to pay closer attention to what's going on around me. I can't always be fooled by you. Elliot kept looking at her with love in his eyes and told her, I wouldn't care how stupid you are because you still have me wrapped around your fingers. Was he calling her stupid? She protested, I'm not stupid. I'm actually quite clever. You are correct. My wife is the most clever woman alive, he said as his grin grew more endearing. It was as if he would never get tired of flirting with her in this manner. How could Anastasia continue to fight after noticing that he was being affectionate with her? At this, he continued to fill her plate with food. Sweetheart, you need to eat more in order to have enough energy tonight. This caused her to quickly blush. Is that all you can think about? Chapter 679 Is there anything else? Elliot closed his eyes and seemed to be thinking about what he was going to say. Then, he said, 
I don't want anything else tonight except you. After hearing this, Anastasia didn't waste any time in lowering her head to start eating, and this man immediately began piling more meat onto her plate. Why did it seem as if he was feeding her to be slaughtered later that night? The next Monday, there was a meeting at Bourgeois in the morning. Anastasia sat at the chief designer's seat and she was dressed in a beige suit with her hair tied back. This gave her delicate and lovely face a natural and tidy appearance. The first topic she wanted to discuss with everyone today was the termination of Catherine's endorsement contract that was recently signed. President Tillman, we just invested $10 million on her. If we break our contract with her, we have to compensate her for liquidated damages. When Anastasia heard that, her eyes turned cold. Then, you should figure out how to avoid compensating her for terminating the contract. Everyone cringed at this statement. They initially thought that she was more pleasant, but they certainly never expected her to throw such a serious challenge at them on her first day. President Tillman, may I know the reason why you are terminating Catherine's contract? I don't like her, Anastasia answered bluntly as she elegantly twirled her long hair around her finger. Her response was both arrogant and straightforward. President Tillman, I understand. I'll take care of it right away. We will have to discuss our new spokesperson after launching the new product at the conference. Do you have any recommendations? You may suggest a few for me to select from, she replied. Felicia was the only one aware of the rationale for her decision. Anastasia asked Felicia to stay. Felicia, please remain. The rest of you may return to work. Felicia looked at Anastasia with admiration in the meeting room. She was really assertive as she expressed her appreciation. Felicia, thank you for alerting me about Catherine, no worries. Of course, Catherine isn't the first woman to openly flirt with President Presgrave. You still must take caution, Anastasia gave a helpless smile when she heard this. It wouldn't upset me if I didn't know about it, but I'll take action if I did, a phone call came into Catherine's office from Bourgeois Advertising and Planning Department to inform her agent that they were terminating their contract with her. What? What is wrong with my artiste? The contract has been signed. I don't think this is a good idea. The decision was made by our boss. Your boss is Vice President Young, correct? He was there when the contract was signed. No, it's our big boss. Who is your big boss? The agent asked anxiously. Miss Anastasia Tillman, President Pressgrave's wife, has taken over as president of Bourgeois Jewelry Atelier. This startled the agent, who quickly responded, If you do this, you will be in breach of contract. Bourgeois would be obliged to pay liquidated damages in this manner. This is definitely something that we do not want to happen. We also wish to continue working with you for a long time. Our contract has an additional clause. If we believe the artiste has not fulfilled the conditions, we have the right to terminate the contract without any compensation. The agent and the employee from Bourgeois engaged in a lengthy discussion, but Catherine's agent was finally forced to concede. Then, she summoned Catherine immediately and questioned her. Catherine, have you been involved in any scandals recently? You were dismissed by Bourgeois due to your indecent conduct. I'm not involved in anything and my past is clean. How could they treat me like this? Catherine was filled with resentment, believing that she had been treated unfairly. It was the big boss decision to call it off. Did you offend her in any way? You mean, Vice President Young? No, Anastasia Tillman, the wife of Elliot Pressgrave, is the current president of Bourgeois. Out of so many people, why would she want to terminate the contract with you? How would I know? Catherine snapped back as her guilt gnawed away at her. It couldn't have been because she tried to seduce Elliot in the hallway that Saturday afternoon, right? Of course, Catherine's agent was reluctant to let such a large endorsement fee slip away so easily. She eventually got a hold of Anastasia's general office line after asking around and decided to ask her in person. Chapter 680 Anastasia was holding a cup of coffee. She had just finished reviewing her upcoming schedule and was getting ready to take a break. At this moment, her office phone began to ring, and she reached out to answer it. Hello? Who is this? 
Hello, is this President Tillman? My name is Georgina Redding. I am Catherine Windsor's manager. I'm sorry to bother you, President Tillman, but I have to clarify something. The popularity and reputation of our artists are great, so I'd like to know exactly what it is about our artists that does not fit the standards of your company. We'll do all we can to resolve the situation as soon as possible, Anastasia's lovely eyes narrowed slightly as she heard this. You might want to find out what your artist was doing in the hallway on the day of the press conference. Tell her, if she does anything like that again, she will no longer be a part of the entertainment business. After she said that, she slammed the phone right away. Did you do anything to upset President Tillman on the day of the press conference? Georgina questioned Catherine, who was seated on the opposite couch after hanging up the phone. W. What could I have done? You better tell me the truth, Georgina snarled. Catherine began to chew on her lips as she grasped the severity of the matter and quickly elaborated, I saw Elliot answering the phone in the hallway the other day. I simply wanted to make an impression on him so that he would remember me. What? How dare you flirt with Elliot? His wife was there at the press conference. Do you even have a brain? Georgina was furious. I, I realize I'm wrong now. Did you know what Anastasia just said to me? She threatened to throw you out of the industry if this happened again. Georgina scolded, out of everyone, the person whom you've chosen to upset was Elliot Pressgrave's wife. You'll be left in dust in no time if she says anything. I, is she really so powerful? Catherine wondered, slightly skeptical. With her status as Mrs. Pressgrave, she can make you disappear in an instant. Forget about the compensation. Do you understand? The next time you see her, move out of her way, Georgina screamed. Though Anastasia had been away from work for so long in Bourgeois, she was still full of enthusiasm. After a short break, she quickly drafted another schedule. She was a member of the company's design team in terms of jewelry design, which meant that she could also make managerial decisions with foresight, knowledge, and determination. At this time, there was a knock at the door and Mason entered after opening it. President Tillman, are you available now? Just call me Anastasia, she said with a smile since he was given special treatment here. No, I'm going to address you as President Tillman when we're in the office. We can forget the formalities after we get off work, he insisted. Then, he sat on the chair opposite from her and asked, I'm just wondering whether the spokesperson has been appointed. If not, I would recommend my sister, Katrina. She had also guessed that he was here for Katrina. After giving it some thought, Mason, you've been kind to me. If you really want to recommend your sister, I can give her a chance. He seldom came to her for help, and she knew it. Thus, she had no intention of rejecting him at this point. Her career as a model has never really taken off, so I really hope she establishes a reputation elsewhere, Mason expressed his concern for his sister's future. All right, I'll tell the people in charge of organizing the event to allow her to promote our brand, Anastasia gave a clear answer. Thank you, President Tillman. After hearing these words, he let out a long sigh of relief. There was no denying the fact that Katrina had exerted a great deal of pressure on him. You're really welcome. You don't often ask me for help. I had to do this, of course, Anastasia grinned. After Mason left, she called the relevant department thereafter and asked them to make some arrangements. As long as Mason asked of her, she was willing to help Katrina. At 3 o'clock p.m., Anastasia's door was knocked on again and she said, Come in. At first, she thought it was her assistant, Grace, bringing in documents, but it was a tall, charming man who casually entered instead. The man strolled in slowly with a smile as he had one hand in his pocket. What are you doing here? Anastasia stood up to greet him. The guy wrapped his arms around her and drew her into a hug before lowering his head and kissing her crimson lips. I'm here to see my wife. As soon as she realized that her window shutters were open, her face became flushed. The blinds are up. Chapter 681 What are you afraid of? I'm not ashamed, Elliot didn't seem to mind and he wanted everyone to see it. Anastasia simply allowed him to do what he wanted. After all, 
she had to admit that he was quite brazen. Are you tired? Would you like a massage from your husband? He asked in a hushed tone. I'm fine. I enjoy working, she answered as she shifted her head to look at him with eyes that sparkled with enthusiasm. Elia was content when he saw how happy she was. Then, he acknowledged, you can work for as long as you wish. Just don't exert yourself, Anastasia scrunched up her nose, playfully and replied, I know, I know. Don't worry about me. He then released her and took two steps back before checking her from head to toe. She felt a little bashful when he observed her in this manner because it made her feel like he was admiring a piece of art. What are you looking at? This made him grin before he said, Your outfit is making me have wild thoughts. She immediately narrowed her gaze at him. Do not try anything silly at the office. When Elliot heard this, he couldn't help but laugh out loud. Does this mean I can do whatever I want when we get home? Anastasia didn't know what to say, so she gave him a shy, angry look, but she was still happy in her heart that he wanted her so much. Then, she said in a low voice, We'll see, did Mason look for you? Elliot inquired as he drew a chair for himself and took a seat before he gracefully crossed his long and slender legs. Only then did Anastasia realize their son for his visit. Was he jealous? How could someone be so easily jealous? Yeah, we had a little chat, she said truthfully. When he heard this, his eyes lit up with jealousy. What did you to discuss? He wanted my help to secure an endorsement contract for his sister. I agreed, Elliot blinked when he heard this. I see. Then Anastasia got up, closed the shutters, walked over to him, and sat on his lap. Even though he enjoyed that she took the initiative, it caught him by surprise. She cradled his face in her hands as she bent her head to plant a kiss on his lips. She had learned certain skills from him and now, she was going to give him a taste of his own medicine by using those techniques on him. Elliot enjoyed her kissing him and placed his arms around her waist. She withdrew just as he was going to get more and she whispered in his ears, you shouldn't be jealous anymore, honey. Other than you, there is no one else in my heart. This caught him off guard and he narrowed his eyes in affectionate response to her gaze. Then, he wrapped his arms tightly around her and said, All right, I'm not jealous. I won't be jealous any longer. Just as Anastasia was about to move away from his lap, he quickly restrained her. Are you leaving now after teasing me? Anastasia's cheeks were still flushed from initiating the kiss, but the man won't release his grip. In the next instant, he grasped the back of her head and gave her a passionate kiss. Elliot's affections for her grew stronger over time. At that moment, Grace wanted to give Anastasia some important documents, so she rushed in without knocking. She was shocked by what she saw and her face blushed due to her being shy, which resulted in her fleeing the scene. The scene inside the room was not appropriate for young folks. Anastasia pushed the man away and Elliot left with a satisfied look. When Grace returned, Anastasia smiled and puckered her lips. Do not tell anyone what happened just now. Grace, of course, didn't dare. However, it looked like she had changed her mind about Anastasia, who had become more gutsy. I won't dare to. Don't worry, President Tillman, Grace answered thoughtfully. At the hospital, Sophia walked out to get some fruits for her dad. She had just returned and was making her way toward the entrance of the ward when she heard her father's anxious voice coming through the open door. Please don't tell Sophia anything about this. Do not land her in such stress. The bank has been pressuring us daily though. If you do not repay them, you will have no other option. We need to think of something. Tiana sighed. We'll see what it takes. If there is nothing else I can do, I'll just go to jail for two years, Drake commented. You can't do that. What should I do when you're gone? The York family was interested in our Sophia and is willing to pay off your debts. Why don't we just let Sophia? Chapter 682 No way. The last time that happened, Sophia fled the country. Drake was distressed on behalf of his daughter. It's one billion. Where are we going to get that money? Whatever it is, I wouldn't let you head back to prison. If you do, I don't want to live anymore. 
Sophia almost dropped the fruits in her hands. What? Dad owes the bank a billion? And as long as I agree to marry Christopher, his family would help Dad pay off his debt. However, she was very grateful for Christopher. After she had fled to avoid their marriage the last time, he still wanted her. Now that his family was offering to help, what more could she ask for? At this moment, she pushed open the door and interrupted the arguing couple. Dad, Mom, I've heard everything, so you can stop arguing now. I'll do it. I'll marry Christopher. Sophia, the couple looked back at their daughter's determined face as they were stunned. As long as I can pay Dad's debts, as long as Dad doesn't go to jail, I'm willing to do anything, Sophia exclaimed with reddened eyes. She had been unfilial as she didn't know that her family was facing such a big crisis. Sophia, there's no rush Drake was about to assure her when he was interrupted. Dad, it's okay. I'm willing to marry Christopher. I'm okay, Sophia insisted as she sniffed. After saying that, she put the fruits down on the table before turning to leave the ward. Outside, she found Christopher's number and dialed it. A gruff male voice sounded. Hello, who is this? I'm Sophia Goodwin. Sophia, is this really you? My dream girl has finally decided to reach out to me. The voice on the other end was ecstatic. I'm prepared to marry you, but can you really help my father with his debts? As long as you marry me, your father will be like my own father. I will help him pay off his debt immediately, Christopher promised. Okay then. Then, let's find a time to meet. That's up to you. I am abroad now. I'll come back on Friday, and I'll pick you up when we've set a date. Great. After she hung up the phone, she sighed as Arthur's face flashed across her mind. At this moment, in a resort abroad, Christopher was basking his 2 pound body in the sun. The towel wrapped around him could barely cover his waist. Young Master York, are you really going to marry Sophia Goodwin and pay off Drake's debt? Sophia is the woman I've always wanted. Of course, I won't be so naive. I'll pay the initial down payment first. After she marries me, she'll be my wife. By then, she'll have to listen to me. Then, it'll be up to me to decide whether I really finish paying off her father's debt or not, Christopher explained with a smile, making a shrewd calculation. A new group of criminals had just been sent to the women's prison in Averna. A woman who was wiping the greasy tabletop raised her head and looked up at the people who were swarming in for lunch. Then, she stopped wiping and looked carefully before she quickly turned her back, afraid that someone would recognize her. The woman was Haley. She was in a gray scrub and had her hair trimmed to her ears. She had been here for almost a month now and had nearly severed all contact from the outside world. However, she did not expect to meet her acquaintance here. Among the people that came in earlier, she knew one of them, Erica Tillman. She had the same haircut as Haley and wore the same clothes, so it was obvious that Erica was sent to serve in prison. Currently, Erica looked haggard and pale. Back then, she was treated like a princess. Now, she was forced to eat things she had never eaten before. The food served here wasn't even served to her servants back at home, but she had no choice. It was as if she was getting her karma served to her. Although she had gone through her initial remorse till her current awakening, it was too late. She would have to spend the second half of her life here as she was serving over 10 years of imprisonment. Erica was quietly eating her rock-solid steamed buns and some rancid noodles when she heard a sharp voice yelling, Haley, what are you doing? Get back to work, right then, Erica froze in her place. She raised her head and looked in the direction of the voice and saw a familiar figure. Although the woman had deliberately turned her back toward her, Erica could still recognize her at a glance. Chapter 683 Haley Seymour A sudden gush of anger was suddenly ignited in Erica's heart because in her eyes, Haley was despicable and shameless. She had blatantly stolen Erica's man and fed her with negative thoughts that ruined her life. Erica thereafter grabbed the soup on the side and walked toward Haley. All this while, Haley had her head lowered in an attempt to avoid Erica recognizing her. However, at this moment, 
She turned around when she heard the approaching footsteps and a bowl of cold soup was immediately splashed across her face. Ah, uh, Haley was struggling to open her eyes when she was slapped hard across the face in the next second. As if the slap wasn't enough, Erica started screaming while reaching out to pull her hair. Haley Seymour, you be chi chi. I'm going to kill you. Erica Tillman, let me go. Haley's scalp began to burn with pain and two correctional officers came over at this moment to separate the two and give them their fair share of scolding. Haley's face was filled with disgust as she wiped her face. As she had gone through several plastic surgeries, the lumps on her forehead were prominent. Haha, <laughs> look at your face. You look like a witch. It's disgusting. Erica sat down and mocked Haley who went back to wiping the table. Hearing this, Haley sneered. And I'll continue to disgust you. We'll have to see each other for more than 10 years anyway. Anastasia is a gem now and known as Mrs. Presgrave. Do you know that she and Elliot are married? She is also the eldest daughter of the Tillman family. As for you, you are just a piece of trash by the side of the road while she is dazzling like a diamond. Erica bit her lips. Of course, she couldn't tell Haley how she really felt because of her envy toward Anastasia. However, right now, she couldn't even have the freedom she desired the most. What was the use of being jealous? Alex is also sentenced. We're all ruined. None of us will live a good life, Haley continued, as she sat across Erica to rest. Erica's eyes darkened at the sound of this. Her parents were jailed and she herself was imprisoned. At the end of the day, had she ever regretted her capriciousness and malice? She was filled with remorse. If she had been given another chance, she would have never destroyed herself to this extent. She would find an average man to marry, have a child together with him, and be a good wife. There's no use regretting, Haley commented as if she could read Erica's mind. Then, Erica raised her head and asked, I still have no idea how you got thrown in here. Haley had no intention of hiding it from Emily. For her, those days were the happiest time of her life. Did you know? That year, when we were plotting against Anastasia, it wasn't a gigolo who entered the room. It was Elliot Presgrave. After Elliot handed her a watch, she then left it on the ground. Then, the waiter contacted me and gave me that watch. Haley clearly remembered the day. When Elliot came to her store to look for her, he was dignified and exuded a masculine charm that made her fall in love with him at first sight. Erica's eyes widened as she prodded, and then, five years later, the business was so bad in my store that I had to sell the watch. A week later, Elliot returned to my store and asked whether I was the woman in the room that night. I said yes, a shameless Haley answered. After that, Erica scolded, you are shameless, you would have done the same. Elliot said he was going to make amends. He gave me a big villa, a sports car, a black card with no limits, and a few servants. At that time, I was beautiful and happy. I could buy whatever I wanted. There would be nights where I get to dine with Elliot and go on jewelry exhibitions together. Speaking of this, Haley turned to Erica. Didn't I get you a few gifts that were worth more than half a million? At this moment, Erica finally knew how Haley became a wealthy woman overnight. It turned out that she had stolen Anastasia's identity and took advantage of the compensation. And that's how I ended up here. I did that for about seven months. I've spent 35 million of Elliot's money. In the end, I was tricked by Anastasia and I was charged with extortion. Then, Haley smiled bitterly and continued, People say you can't have too much of a good thing because it'll eventually bite you in the back. And because of this, she was using the rest of her life to pay for her mistakes. Chapter 684 Erica initially wanted to call out Haley for being insatiable and not knowing her boundaries. However, when Erica reflected on herself, she was also someone with blood on her hands. Instead, she said nothing for a while because she deserved to end up here. A financial summit was held in the city on Friday and it was an event which the people of the financial industry took with seriousness. After reading the email, a woman sitting in the spacious office had a complicated look in her eyes. That woman was Lolari Presgrave. 
Ever since her last meeting with Elliot, she had accepted his recommendation to work in another financial company. All this while, she had been restraining herself and waiting for the opportunity to show up. She did not dare to offend him and did not want to confront Anastasia in the open. Lolari's father had been eyeing a project under Elliot's hands. Although her father wanted to get a hold of it, the Pressgrave group had strict rules. They would rather cooperate with outsiders than the people of the Pressgrave family as this had been an unwritten rule of the Pressgrave family. However, Lolari's father wasn't the only one who had their eyes on the wealth of the Pressgrave group. All of them were waiting for one thing. They patiently waited year after year while looking forward to Harriet's death. Once she was out of the picture, Elliot would be on his own. Without her strict defense, he might not be able to withstand the pressure of the entire family. Lolari had been looking forward to this moment as she was confident that he would show up. At that time, Anastasia wouldn't be by his side, and Lolari might be able to seize this chance to strike. She was confident in herself and did not believe there were men who wouldn't cheat. At Pressgrave Group, Elliot had also received the invitation and accepted it. There were several companies that he was interested in cooperating with that were attending the summit this time. Anastasia had accompanied him to the company today. Bourgeois was implementing a reformation plan and had decided to buy a diamond mine and raw stones abroad. This was necessary as their company had decided to create a luxurious and customizable platform. Six high-level executives of the company were gathered in the conference room. Anastasia sat on the main seat with her long hair on her shoulders while she listened to her subordinates' reports with firm, bright eyes and radiated the aura of a charismatic leader. It required a different kind of courage for one to be a leader, which was something that Anastasia had been exercising. As the Pressgrave family had many extended family members, she had to shoulder the burden of being the lady boss of the family, and there would be more things that would require her to decide in the future. After the meeting, she called for Larry and carefully listened to his opinions. He was a senior executive of Bourgeois and was more experienced in this area. President Tillman, if we want Bourgeois to grow and be stronger, it is vital for us to have our own mine. Now, several big foreign brands have already begun to monopolize the stones. We will have to make a decision soon. What's the recovery rate for extraction? According to our current data, the recovery rate is within the acceptable range. However, this is something like a gamble. We would need luck to be on our side. Hearing this, Anastasia nodded. Okay, I'll decide in three days' time. Not long after Larry left, there was a knock on the door, to which she responded, Come in. The person at the door was Katrina. She was at the company to sign a contract and came especially to thank Anastasia. Anastasia, thank you for giving me this opportunity, she commented while failing to contain her excitement. You should read through the terms and conditions of our contract. I hope that you will abide by it. You only get one chance. Please cherish it, Anastasia said. When Katrina heard this, she felt her heart tighten. The silent warning behind Anastasia's words pressured her as her personal life was never smooth. I know. I won't let you down. Then, Katrina added, Please take care of my brother. Definitely, Anastasia nodded. At this moment, Katrina's gaze wandered to the necklace Anastasia was wearing. She could tell at first glance that it was rare and valuable, and this caused envy to brew in her heart. Anastasia, the diamonds on your neck are beautiful. It must cost millions, she said in jealousy. Anastasia pursed her lips and smiled. My husband gave it to me. I didn't ask him about the price. At this moment, darkness flashed through Katrina's eyes. It would be great if she managed to seduce Elliot in the future. Now that she was endorsing Bourgeois, she had a higher chance of meeting him. Chapter 685 I'll make a move first, Katrina left as she did not want to disturb the woman. She took out her phone and began making a series of phone calls. What's the matter? Asked the man on the other end. I received bourgeois endorsement, so how are you going to help me celebrate, young master Jacob? She asked proudly. I'll pick a hotel to celebrate tonight, Jacob answered. 
Katrina cheerfully replied as she thought to herself, his last name is Presgrave, but Jacob Presgrave is just another second-generation nouveau rich. In the evening, while she was being held in Jacob's arms, she voiced the questions that were going through her mind. Jacob, you said you called Elliot Presgrave your cousin. Why is he extremely wealthy when your family is very low profile? She asked. You mean to say that our family has no money, right? He snorted coldly. Of course, your family is wealthier than the common people, but you can't compare it to Elliot Presgrave. She exclaimed quickly. With a sigh of annoyance, Jacob remarked, if old Madame Presgrave hadn't lived so long, we might have already been on the Presgrave Group's board of directors. My father stated that when the old woman passes away, our family would become wealthy sooner or later. Really? Katrina's eyes widened as she realized she couldn't afford to let him go in this situation. Once that old woman has passed away and Anastasia Tillman is the principal of the company, heck, what does she know? He sneered. She was still unconvinced. Why does Anastasia Tillman, who used to live in a run-down rented house abroad, now serve as president of Bourgeois and manage the company? She actually looked forward to the day Anastasia would have a run of bad luck because it would definitely leave Katrina with loads of relief. Back at the hospital, three days flew past in what seemed like the blink of an eye while Sophia was there with her parents. She had forgotten something due to her father's debt which was to return to Arthur Weiss's side. Therefore, she received a call from that man at that moment. Hello, please extend my leave for two more days, Mr. Weiss, she asked instead because she couldn't understand what the other party was saying. What? Is your father in critical condition? He inquired flatly. My father still needs my assistance with a few things around here. I can't leave, all right. I'll give you two more days, Arthur agreed politely. Thank you. When Sophia thought of something, she exhaled a sigh of relief before uttering, Mr. Weiss, he reacted in a low voice. Yeah, oh, I'll hang up first since it's nothing. Sophia hung up the phone with her hand still grasping it, as if she was taken aback. She had planned to tell him that she was going to be engaged, but after giving it some thought, she realized that there was nothing between them. Christopher flew home that night itself and planned to meet with his parents tomorrow at 1.2.00 p.m. to discuss the engagement. The York family was eager to help with debt payback. Drake, on the other hand, found himself in a difficult predicament. To get through this tough period, he had no alternative but to rely on his daughter's marriage. Sophia was well aware of this. No matter how disloyal she was, she couldn't stand by and watch her father being arrested. Therefore, now that the York family had indicated that they were willing to marry her and assist in paying off the debt, she was very grateful. Over at Arthur's villa, Emily had just returned from downtown in her new dress. She couldn't wait to show it to Arthur and walked straight to the study on the second floor. Artie, do you like my new dress? She said as she turned around in front of him. Arthur wore a black shirt with embroidered designs on them, but the sense of dignity that was inherently present in his physique was always obvious to the public. Well, it's beautiful, he complimented her. Emily, on the other hand, saw that he only gave her a passing glance and did not appear to be impressed in any way. You are being perfunctory to me, she said, rather disappointed. Her mood appeared to have improved during Sophia's absence throughout these three days, but whenever Sophia was around, Emily always felt suffocated. She discovered that Arthur preferred to be alone. When he had nothing to do, he would read books in the study room or work, but she never saw him taking the initiative to ask her out. Each time she asked him about it, he would always refuse her. Chapter 686 Arctic, is there something on your mind? You can talk to me about it. Emily sat beside him and hugged his arm as she looked at him with doe eyes. No, Arthur shook his head. Then, she pursed her lips and asked, Are you thinking about Sophia? Hearing this, he raised his beautiful eyebrows and answered again, No, how could he possibly miss her? Anyway, she couldn't escape until she returned his family heirloom. At 9.30 p.m., 
Anastasia accompanied her son into the room and helped him take a bath before changing into his adorable cartoon pajamas. Jared's wet hair was combed to the side, revealing his handsome and delicate little face, making him look like a young prince. Jared, it's your birthday soon. Think about what you want as your present, she said. Will you give me anything I want? The little guy asked slyly. Yes, I will. She would, of course, do anything for him. Then, Jared smiled and requested, Okay then. I'll tell you what I want for my birthday. I want a brother and sister for my birthday present. When Anastasia heard this, she kept quiet for a few seconds before bursting into laughter. I can't give you that by your birthday. I'm not in a rush for it, mommy. You can give them to me for my birthday present next year. This made her sigh softly. She knew that her son was a little lonely. She gently stroked his little head and said, Choose another gift. Let mommy think about this one for a bit. The little guy immediately asked for another set of Legos, and she pulled him into a hug and kissed his head. Okay, I'll get that for you. After tucking Jared to bed, Anastasia returned to her room, picked up a briefcase from the couch, and looked through the documents. Elliot had a social gathering tonight, so she had to wait for him to return. At about 11 o'clock p.m., she heard the sound of a car, and soon, a handsome figure stepped through the door. The black suit and pants gave him a stylish yet domineering look. He looked like he had just stepped out of a magazine. Why are you still looking through documents? Elliot sat down and took the documents from her hands before continuing distressingly, it's late. Stop working. At this moment, Anastasia took a whiff of him. You reek of alcohol. How much did you drink? I didn't drink much. I'll take a shower. He did not want the smell to rub off on her. Although he didn't drink much, the room reeked with the smell of alcohol and it absorbed into his clothes. Lying in bed, Anastasia suddenly thought of her son's birthday wish earlier. Because of the pain she had experienced during childbirth, she was under a lot of pressure. If she were to have another child, it was inevitable that she would have to experience what she endured again. However, the kins of the press grave were phasing out. Thus, she was still burdened with the task of continuing their bloodline. Before she could think more about it, she saw Elliot walking out with a bath towel. His sculpted and muscular body shone under the light, filling her with as he lay in bed and took her into his arms, Anastasia couldn't help but tell him about her son's wish. The decision is yours to make. I won't force you, he leaned in to kiss her head. I'm fine with just Jared, then... Anastasia raised her head slightly and asked, Have you ever thought about having another child? I've thought about it. I wanted a daughter so that she could be as beautiful as you. E.L. Iot curled his lips into a smile. How could he not want another child? However, he was afraid that she would have to go through the pain of childbirth again and he couldn't bear it. She was curious as well. If she were to have a daughter, would the child look like Anastasia or E.L. Iot? Then, he stretched his hand slightly and looked over at her in surprise. Honey, why didn't you tell me? Anastasia immediately snorted. Don't you keep track of the days? How dare you ask me to tell you? Of course, I won't. In a blink of an eye, he pulled at her into his arms with force. You little devil, are you trying to starve your husband? This was a good enough reason for him to punish her, but soon, E.L. Iot was a little annoyed. I forgot to buy them. I'll call Ray. Chapter 687 Just as Elliot was about to get up, Anastasia reached out to hug his neck. Then, we don't have to use it, he immediately understood what she meant and was taken by surprise. Then, he kissed her gently and asked in a hoarse voice, Sweetheart, are you sure? I am. She had promised Jared, so she decided to try and see if she could fulfill his wish of giving him a sister on his birthday next year. At the break of dawn, Arthur suddenly had the urge to visit Sophia's father after waking up. After all, he had nothing better to do. Deciding that he wanted it to be a surprise, he did not inform her about it. He used other means to get information about Drake's whereabouts. After all, the Goodwin's company was in his hands. 
To avoid Emily, Arthur left at about 10 o'clock a.m. to drive directly to the hospital since his bodyguard had bought him a gift in advance, so he drove directly to the hospital. At the hospital, Drake and the rest of his family were just at the entrance, as his driver was on the way to bring them to a restaurant for lunch. As Drake couldn't walk, he was pushed out in a wheelchair. At this moment, a pickup truck drove up toward them and the man who stepped out was Christopher coming to pick Sophia up. At 5 feet 7 inches, he weighed nearly 200 pounds in sportswear and his body looked plumper than ever. His chin and neck were almost touching each other, but this did not stop him from liking beautiful women at all. He and Sophia were classmates from junior high until they were in university. She had always been the a girl since she was young as she was beautiful. Thus, Christopher had always been dreaming of getting her. As for Sophia's parents, they hoped that she would be taken care of for the rest of her life. Although he was a little plump, he came from a wealthy family, so their daughter would be able to live a prosperous life in the future. Dad, Mom, let Uncle G take you to the restaurant first. We'll meet you there in a bit, Sophia said. All right, we'll get going then. Then, she followed Christopher into his car where he immediately acted like a gentleman. Sophia, today is a great day for us. Come, let's get a gift for you. Let us go eat first, she deflected. She did not want anything from him. You're going to be my wife soon, and it's only right for me to give you a gift. Then, he drove her straight to the jewelry store. Although she had repeatedly refused the offer, he still tried to force a diamond ring on her finger. Ultimately, she had no choice but to wear it on her ring finger. This made him grin so widely that his triple chin was on full display. Sophia, you're so beautiful today. Did you know how many boys were after you back in high school? Now, I can finally call you mine, he boasted. He had already made up his mind to bribe the media to report their wedding. That way, he would look even more imposing. The most beautiful girl in school was now his wife, which made it extremely wonderful. However, Sophia had no intention of being his trophy wife. She looked at the time and said, it's time for us to head over to the restaurant. Then, Christopher finally drove them toward the restaurant. In the hospital corridor, a group of young nurses was stunned by the sight of a man in a white shirt, who became the focus of all the women. He was like a protagonist out of a novel while the two bodyguards made him appear cold and hostile with a domineering aura. Arthur stood at the door of the ward. He stopped outside for a few seconds before he reached out to push open the door, expecting to see Sophia's surprised face. However, the ward was empty. When a nurse passed by, he politely asked the nurse in a charming voice, excuse me, has the patient here been discharged? It just so happened that the nurse happened to be in charge of the ward. Mr. Goodwin is not discharged yet, she hurriedly answered. He just went out for lunch. If I'm not wrong, his daughter is getting engaged today. At the sound of this, his dark pupils suddenly shrank. Engaged? Chapter 688. Yes, that is correct. According to what I've heard, they will meet the groom's family and discuss the engagement. Sir, are you related to him? No, the man kept his composure and gave a quick smile, but as soon as he walked away, his face looked gloomy. How could she not tell him she was going to get engaged? Arthur pulled out his phone and called Sophia's number right away. Sophia was in the car that Christopher was driving. When she heard her phone rang, she pulled it out and checked it. Once she saw who was calling, she immediately ended the call. Why didn't you answer? Christopher asked out of curiosity. It's nothing important, at the hospital lobby, the man couldn't believe that she had just hung up on him. When he thought about that, he gripped the phone even tighter. Find out where Drake's daughter's engagement is, Arthur ordered his bodyguard behind him. The bodyguard contacted the executive at Goodwin Corporation who put him in touch with Drake's driver. The driver gave them the address and room number of the restaurant. Arthur then entered the car and calmly said, drive to the restaurant. Christopher's car slowly pulled into the restaurant's parking lot during this time. When Sophia got out of the vehicle, he suddenly hugged her. This startled Sophia, so she avoided and told him, 
Don't do this. We do not want anyone to see us. What's the problem? After this meal, you will be my wife anyway. He wanted to move in with Sophia so badly right now. Even though they were going to get married in future, she still resisted him deeply. Fine. At the very least, we should hold hands. Christopher ignored her refusal and forced to take her hand. Sophia had no choice but to follow him inside the restaurant while holding her hand. At the restaurant, Drake and his wife were chatting with the York couple. Since they were both businessmen, this was something that they had in common. Their conversation led to the Goodwin Corporation incident when a hostile acquisition left Drake with no one to turn to when it happened. His business was thriving until there was an unexpected hostile acquisition, which resulted in him owing a significant amount of money to the bank. All of this happened as a result of his daughter losing the heirloom that belonged to a young man. Anyway, the past is the past. Please look out for us since we will soon be in laws, Drake added. Of course. After all, our son is totally crazy about Sophia. Christopher walked in while holding Sophia's hand as they were talking. After taking their seats, the two families began ordering food. In the meantime, Emma was observing her daughter seated next to a plump Christopher. She felt terrible for Sophia since she was unhappy with this engagement. Sophia. I'll take good care of you in the future. Once you're married to Christopher, please hurry ahead and bless our family with a grandchild. I definitely want to have a grandchild soon, Margaret thought to herself as she looked at Sophia's lovely face. My future grandchildren's genes will definitely be amazing. Why don't we skip thee and get straight to the wedding planning? At this point, we are able to discuss the dowry and what should be done with it. We are generous, we have decided to give two million dollars, Edmund York had already decided what he will do. We have no demands on the dowry. Everything is fine so long as Sophia is happy, Drake nodded. Edmund had an idea right away. Oh, Drake, how about we help you pay off half of your debt to make things easier and then figure out what to do about the rest? Drake and his wife looked at each other in silence. Because of how things were, they had no other choice as they no longer had any pride left to ask for more. But we also hope you can give something as your part of the wedding gift, Margaret said out of the blue. When Emma heard this, she quickly added, We'll absolutely prepare our side of the wedding gift too, in that case, let's just get right to it. Drake, we are interested in your land. So, we're wondering whether you may make it as your gift for the wedding, Drake and his wife exchanged yet another glance. Our land? However, this land is valued at $50 million on the market. It wasn't that the couple didn't want to give the land as a wedding gift. Instead, it was their only remaining possession. Sophia was shocked to hear this and she looked at the York family. They want a piece of land as a wedding gift? Mr. Drake, we'll build a house on that piece of land. We'll bring you two over to stay with us by then, Christopher said. He thought that his family deserved to benefit financially from Chapter 689. Drake and his wife found themselves in a terrible predicament. They couldn't help but think, we thought that marrying off our daughter would be a joyful occasion, but the wedding gift that the other side is asking for seems ridiculous. Don't tell me you're hesitant to give it up, Drake Edmund continued in his pursuit. Well, that's not really true. We'll get ready for our part of the wedding gift, but this land is under my father's name. I don't think I have much of a say in this. However, I heard that you inherited the land from him. Certainly, you can make that decision. We also want our children to have a nicer place to live once they marry. Wouldn't you agree? You will provide the land, and we will assist in the construction of a villa. In the end, it's for the benefit of our children, Mr. and Mrs. York. I'm not too choosy about where I live. Also, I have my own so after Christopher and I get married, we can just move into my apartment, Sophia said. An apartment? That can't be right. Christopher can't live in an apartment. We have always given him the best of everything since he was a child. In case you didn't know, Margaret refuted in a strong manner and made it sound like his son was a rare and precious gem. A large black SUV pulled up in front of the restaurant's entrance. 
The bodyguard stepped out of the vehicle to open the rear passenger seat door. The man's slender and long legs stepped out and he walked right inside the restaurant. Do you have any reservations, sir? We're here to look for someone, his bodyguard answered. Arthur asked, where is the prima room? Oh, this way, sir. The server catered to their needs with enthusiasm. While directing them to the prima room, the waitress could not resist catching a glimpse of the male visitor. He is extremely attractive. Is he a celebrity? At the same time, the atmosphere in the prima room had become a little awkward. The York family was keen about getting that piece of land, but the Goodwin family was in a dilemma. The room's door was pushed open at this moment, and the sweet voice of the waitress welcoming someone was heard shortly after. Please enter, sir. The two families turned their heads and glanced at the door in surprise while a noble-looking man entered the room. Sophia was so shocked when she saw the man that she jumped from her seat. Mr. Weiss, why are you here? She asked, looking at the man with bewilderment. Arthur shifted his eyes from the two families in their seats to the plump man next to Sophia. He narrowed his eyes as he thought, Is this the man she's going to marry? Is she blind? This man does not deserve to be with her. When Drake and his wife saw the man, they were shocked as well and would never intentionally upset him. Furthermore, their daughter owed him a family heirloom. As Christopher saw the uninvited guest, something inside his mind warned him to be cautious of this man. So, he rose up and said in an unpleasant tone, Who are you? Do you not realize that this is a private session? Hurry and leave. When Sophia detected Christopher's unpleasant tone, she hurriedly introduced him to Arthur. This is my friend, Christopher. Sophia, what do you think this means? How can you invite a male friend to our engagement party? Christopher was furious. When he saw that this man was truly exceptional, he became really angry. No, that's not what it is. She waved her hands to indicate that he had misunderstood. She then reached out her hands to push and drag Arthur toward the door. Mr. Weiss, why don't we talk about this outside? Arthur turned around and followed her to the door. Sophia closed the door behind her once they were outside. Young Master Weiss, why are you here? She asked, feeling confused. Are you going to get married to that pig inside there? He laughed as if he had just seen a joke. An embarrassed Sophia said, Don't say such rude things about him, will you? Aren't you afraid that he'll squash you? He didn't pay attention to her and kept making nasty remarks. Her face immediately turned red with embarrassment when she heard that. Can't this man at least respect me? Yes, young Master Weiss. I'm getting engaged soon and no longer can serve you. Please revoke our agreement, she said with a serious expression. She believed that the only way to resolve her father's debt was to sever T.I.'s with Arthur. I disagree. You cannot leave my side for a whole year. He crossed his arms and gave her a harsh glare. Sophia choked when she heard that. Since she was determined to have nothing to do with him, she could only say, in short, I'm getting engaged. I'm going to get married to someone else. So, all I can say is that from now on, I'll only stay on the side of the man I'm going to marry. Chapter 690 Does your fiancé know about our relationship? Arthur narrowed his eyes and asked. Sophia's cheeks reddened after hearing this. Why does he act as if we are having an affair? For goodness sake, we're just friends. Why does he have to complicate our relationship? Sophia bit her lip and said, There's nothing between us at that moment. Sophia didn't notice that someone from inside was opening the door behind her. From the corner of his eye, Arthur could see and even figure out who that person was. So, he unintentionally made himself sound even more ambiguous than before. Have you forgotten that we used to sleep in the same room? You even saw me naked. Christopher, who had just opened the door and walked out, heard the statement at first instance. Since he was angry, he asked out loud, Sophia, what is your relationship with him? His voice took Sophia by surprise and she immediately turned to him and explained, Christopher, please don't misunderstand. There's nothing between. Suddenly, her face was cupped by Tefer and delicate hands. Without giving her time to react, 
A set of thin, rejuvenating lips kissed her soft lips. This took Sophia completely by surprise. Christopher could only watch as his future fiancé was being kissed by another man. The bodyguard who stood by the side was also surprised as he saw young Master Weiss initiating a kiss with a woman. After kissing Sophia, Arthur flashed a smug look and sneered at Christopher to provoke him. Sophia was dazed and completely stupefied by the kiss until she heard Christopher's angry voice. Let go of her. She's my girlfriend, and you have no right to touch her. Suddenly, an arm was wrapped around her waist as Christopher finished ranting. She was flattened in an embrace with a cedar-scented chest the next second. I've touched her, so what are you going to do? Arthur smirked as he kissed her hair. Sophia, you ought to think this through. Your father's $10 billion debt will be due soon, and if you are not engaged with me, no one's going to pay for him. He may need to spend at least three years in jail if he can't pay up. Christopher was still determined to get Sophia for himself. After all, he'd never give up something he'd never touched before. Just as Sophia was about to push off Arthur, a deep male voice said, You're willing to marry yourself to this pig for a mere $10 billion? How can you be such a loser? She had never heard such haughty remarks in her life. Meanwhile, Christopher became enraged when he heard that someone spoke of him as a pig. You, then, why don't you try to take out $10 billion in one go? When he watched Arthur extend out his hand, the bodyguard gave him a black wallet. Arthur withdrew a black card from his wallet and handed it to Sophia. Take it and use the money to pay off your father's debt. Return to serve me after you've settled it, when Christopher saw it. His eyes widened in amazement. He observed not one, but maybe six or seven black cards in this man's wallet, if he wasn't mistaken. With his current net worth, even he himself was ineligible to upgrade to a black card. Sophia was shocked when she looked at the black card and raised her head. She knew she couldn't accept something like that from him. So, she quickly shook her head and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Weiss. I can't take your card. Let's just ignore him, Sophia. I'm sure he has plans to do something bad. Let's go inside. Christopher then moved toward her and tried to pull her away from Arthur, but Arthur's bodyguard came R immediately and stopped Christopher from getting close. Sophia broke free from Arthur's grip on her waist. Then she told him, please let go of me. Thank you. When he heard that, he was a little disappointed. This woman is willing to marry someone else instead of accepting his assistance? Christopher thought it was finally. His turn to give Arthur a provoking smirk as Sophia walked toward him. He was shocked by what Sophia was about to say, which came as a surprise. Looking at him, she said, Christopher, let's cancel our engagement for today. I'm not marrying you. Why? He looked at her anxiously. Sophia wasn't a fool. She knew that when the York family asked her to marry Christopher and said they would help her father pay off his debt, it was just empty promises. Out of greed, they even asked for a piece of her parents' land as a wedding gift for her. She had actually thought about it while she was inside the room and wondered whether she could get her parents to sell everything they owned to pay off the debt. She was also willing to stay with her parents in a rental home and accompany them. Moreover, she could also tell that her parents were having trouble deciding what to do about the piece of land. She knew that the York family was using paying off the debt as an excuse to pressure her parents. Chapter 691 Sophia was in her own world for a few seconds until the man's deep gaze landed on her. It was only at that moment when she regained her composure and approached him. Suddenly, she almost lost balance due to the slippery road beneath her. Ah, uh, she yelled as she lost her balance and fell into his arms. Arthur wrapped his arms around her to prevent her from falling, but he was a second late. As Sophia hugged the man, she landed in a kneeling position in front of his legs and her face was exceptionally close to a place in which a man would regard as sensitive. She wanted to die on the spot. He lowered his head and sighed because in all his time of knowing her, this was the umpteenth time of seeing her embarrassed. Luckily for them, there was no one around them. So, he reached out and helped her to her feet, but her face was redder than a shrimp. 
as sorry, Arthur took her hand as his long, slender fingers gripped onto hers. It was evident that he was holding Sophia in a posture that looked like they were about to kiss. They passed the entrance and walked up the steps, which they estimated to be at a distance of 200 meters, to where the main church was. It was halfway through the climb that Sophia regretted her decision as she panted. Of all the places that she could have suggested, why did she have to suggest a church on the hill? On the contrary, the man next to her was relaxed. He wasn't panting and his face wasn't flushed either. As the wind gently blew his hair into a somewhat messy state, it made him look just as sexy. You can't climb up anymore? Arthur asked with a smile. I, I still can, now that she was under his gaze, she bravely replied. I can even do it in one breath. Arthur continued his climb while Sophia forced herself to follow from behind as a film of cold sweat coated her forehead. Now that they were at the top of the hill, she felt that it was worth the hard work since the view from where they were was breathtaking. The ancient church resembled a quiet place with a vast history behind it. He was holding a bottle of water, which he brought from the car. Then, he walked toward her and handed the bottle to her. Drink it. When Sophia saw that the bottle was half full, she realized that he had already drunk half of it and left the rest for her. What's up? Do you have something against my saliva? Arthur read her thoughts. She shook her head and sincerely took it with a blushing face before she unscrewed the bottle cap. Who am I to slander? We've already kissed, so what am I being picky about? Both Sophia and Arthur went to the main area of the church where candles could be found for them to use to offer their prayers. Then, she took six candles and lit it before handing it to him. Follow my actions and say your prayers. They say that miracles occur if you offer your prayers here. So hopefully it will be granted. When he took it, he followed her suspiciously. Firstly, they left the bright candles at the candle holder at one side of the church before they walked to the pews and knelt down. Sophia was unaware that when she made a wish, the man beside her still had his eyes open as he observed her beautiful yet serious face. It was as if she arduously tried to make a sincere prayer. Once that was done, the corners of her lips curled up into a smile. When this happened, it caused Arthur to subconsciously follow suit and when he saw her bright red thick lips, his heart skipped a beat. As he observed her dazzling and long eyelashes, he hurriedly closed his eyes in a comical manner so as to pretend that he was in the midst of offering his prayers. Now that it was Sophia's turn to admire him, she realized that he still had not offered his prayers. He looked even more handsome now that his eyes were closed. His facial features seemed to have been meticulously carved by the angels above with perfect proportions. She softly swallowed and harbored inexplicable thoughts while watching him. What's going on? Is it because he kissed me? Her heart started to race as she thought of this. Wait, this isn't going according to plan. I'm the one who seduced him to make him fall for me, after which I'll beg for his forgiveness. So, why am I having second thoughts about him? Although Arthur's eyes were closed, he was a sensitive man and knew that Sophia was sizing him up. As a result, he purposely took his time to open his eyes. After emerging from the main area of the church, they arrived at the community center where she couldn't help but say, Young Master Weiss, this is where the young single people meet up to socialize with each other. Do you want to head in and get to know a few girls? Who knows you might be able to meet your miss, right? Chapter 692 When the man heard what Sophia said, he asked in a serious tone, So, does that mean you'll do anything I tell from now on? You to do Sophia's face suddenly turned red, but she answered him with boldness. Yes, you'll have an hour to return to my villa, he demanded. Sure, I'll be right back, she responded before she hung up the phone with relief. The debt is paid off. Mom and Dad don't have to struggle to make a living, and I can stay with him for the rest of my life. Sophia felt like she was in a trance as she gazed at the sunshine beyond the window. She was surprised that she didn't feel trapped when she thought she would be with Arthur for a long time. Instead, it made her feel happy and she even looked forward to it. After an hour, Sophia went to Arthur's villa and ran into Emily as she was having her afternoon tea. 
When Emily first saw her, she was so mad that she threw up her tea and called Sophia out of the blue. Hey you, come here. Sophia walked right over to her when she heard that. Can I help you in any way, Miss Jennings? Emily pushed the desserts off the table all of a sudden. It's dirty on the floor. Come here and clean it up. Sophia watched as Emily tried to create a scene on purpose. If it was before, she'd ignore Emily for sure. Now, though, things are different. Arthur's guest is Emily while I work for him. So, doing these things will come naturally to me. Yes, Miss Jennings. Sophia was on her knees and picked up the desserts that had fallen on the floor, but all of a sudden, Emily stomped on one of the desserts with her shoe. She took them off and said, My shoes are dirty on the bottom. Why don't you wash it after you finish cleaning up this mess? Sophia nodded and kept wiping the floor while she was on her knees. Arthur appeared at the front entrance before he slowly entered. He saw Emily in the garden, sitting cross-legged on a reclining chair with a teacup in one hand, and dessert sprawled on the floor underneath her. Then, he noticed Sophia, who was kneeling down and collecting the desserts off the ground as if she were a servant. Emily was feeling smug as she watched Sophia clean up the mess she had intentionally made when she heard a cold male voice say, Stop cleaning. Sophia's hand stopped moving when she heard that voice. Then, she turned her head to look at the man who was coming toward them. She continued picking up those desserts instead of rising to her feet. She was pulled to her feet by a hand that reached out to grab it. When she heard the man's voice, it sounded a little bit mean. I said, stop picking. Are you deaf? Sophia took her hand back as she looked down. Yes. Then she looked at Emily's shoes, which were placed to one side and said, Miss Jennings, let me clean your shoes. Emily couldn't help but smirk when she saw that Sophia knew how to behave. Make sure to clean it well, she added. Arthur knew what was going on because he knew Emily well. He had seen the desserts on the floor and the dessert stains on her shoes. Emily, she is my personal maid. Please order your personal attendants to take care of all of your everyday needs. Don't instruct Sophia any longer, he told Emily before instructing Sophia, Stop cleaning and come inside with me. Emily pouted her lips unhappily and demanded, Artie, why can't I make her do what I want? How is she better than my servant? No means no and it's final. Arthur maintained his calm manner. Then, he dragged Sophia into the living room where he reminded her, Moving forward, you must serve me only and no one else. Sophia's delicate cheeks flushed slightly when she heard the words serve me only because these were incredibly vague affectionate terms. As always, she did what she was told and nodded. I understand. Go back to your room and rest. Arthur gave her his instructions. He couldn't attend to her for long because he had some business to take care of. Sophia returned to her room and she received a phone call from her father thereafter. He contacted to see if it was Arthur who had helped him settle his debt. Dad, yes. I'm now working for him, so it may be a while before I can see you and Mom. Logically, I should detest him because he took over my company by force. Drake was experiencing feelings that were somewhat conflicting. Why did he take over your business, Dad? Sophia wondered. It's because I managed the business inefficiently and failed to turn a profit. Drake sighed. He recalled how ruthless Arthur had been the last time he took over the business. There was no introduction or advance notice as the man simply appeared and seized his company. Chapter 693 One of his other business partners had used the company's shares as collateral for a loan of hundred of billion dollars. For this reason, the company was sold and the sale proceeds were transmitted directly to the bank. It was later found out that Drake was also responsible for another debt, which had been taken out in his name. This was the said debt that Arthur had settled up in full. Drake was furious but also helpless. There was, however, nothing he could do to change the situation. As a result, he had little choice but to accept his fate. On top of that, he had always planned on retiring someday. Dad, focus on your health first, Sophia comforted him. She stood by the handrail on the second story and glanced down at Arthur working on his laptop downstairs as she spoke. The man seemed so cold, stoic, and charming at the same time. 
Up until now, she hadn't been able to believe that those delicately pursed lips of his had kissed her. Anastasia arrived at the company earlier in the morning to meet a few important visitors. As a jewelry designer, she'd always been attentive and patient with clients. Even though she was with a prominent status now, she still met with every client and that dignified attitude of hers captivated them. In less than a half hour and two cups of coffee later, she was able to secure nearly 10 million worth of custom orders for three prominent women. Anastasia was aware that the jewelry market was becoming increasingly competitive. That meant that if they truly wanted to break away from their old operating model, they had to go all out at the top end and she wanted to build Bourgeois into a top-tier company in the industry. During her time as an employee at Bourgeois, she was aware that the company had a lot of unproductive staff. She was aware that the majority of these slackers were executive levels who received substantial perks from their positions without performing any effort. With this in mind, she made the decision to restructure the entire organization and redeployment of staff. Anastasia trusted Felicia, Larry, and Mason the most out of all the employees she knew and they were already in the conference room at this stage. The process of personnel reformation was quickly brought to a conclusion. The vice president was held by Larry while Felicia was promoted to regional chief director. On the other hand, Mason was given an instant promotion and had the responsibility of running the general business operations of the Bourgeois Couture line as general manager. The first thing that Anastasia had to do was to give them responsibilities that were suited for their level of expertise. In the afternoon, the executives of the Bourgeois organization underwent a transformation. All of the managers who believed their jobs were secure and well compensated were demoted to positions of less significance, whereas their salaries were also based on their sales performance. Meanwhile, the employees who had worked earnestly and honestly for the company were also promoted and rehired. For a moment, sounds of complaints and rants echoed in the big office of Bourgeois while those who were rehired realized at the same time that the top management of the corporation had practiced fairness and justice. This realization motivated their strong will to devote themselves to their work. Once she was done restructuring the company, Anastasia was looking at some documents in her office. Suddenly, she heard Grace's voice coming from outside and judging from the lady's intonation, she sounded like she was anxiously stopping someone. No, you can't enter. President Tillman is working. Regardless of what, Grace still couldn't stop the burly male manager with that petite figure of hers. Coincidentally, this male manager was one of those executives who had been transferred from his original position. Feeling resigned, he pushed open the door and made his way across to Anastasia's desk. President Tillman, what's the meaning of this? I have been working in Bourgeois for eight years. I'm pretty sure I could get some credit for my efforts, but how could you demote me just like that? Observing the agitated male manager in front of her, Anastasia calmly stood up. She stared at Gordon Quigley, the male manager, with a piercing gaze and spoke, Mr. Quigley, I must remind you that Bourgeois will not support idlers from now on. You can submit your resignation if you don't wish to cooperate with this transfer decision. I'm more than happy to receive your resignation letter. Anastasia, do you think you are that great? You're nothing but a mere designer who became lucky and able to climb to the top. Gordon sneered, after which he quickly added, All in all, you successfully seduced a man like Elliot just because you have a pretty face. I'm telling you. I have already been holding the position of a manager even before you joined Bourgeois. How dare you demote me now? Likewise, Anastasia didn't intend to pamper anyone in the company. Therefore, she said coldly, I dare to because I'm the boss of Bourgeois. I have the right to make any decision. Anastasia, you can transfer me to another position, but I'm not fine with a salary reduction. If you don't implement it, I'll go on a strike with all my men. Since Gordon was previously the manager of Bourgeois, he had quite a number of subordinates under him. I dare you if you have this ability. We shall see if the evidence in my hand would send you to jail first, or your strike will come first. After she finished speaking, 
She coldly recounted his charges. Don't think I don't know what you have been up to. I have calculated the amount of money that you have illegally transferred out all these years. It's at least more than eight million, if not ten million. Chapter six hundred ninety-four. When Gordon heard Anastasia's words, the arrogance on his face instantly turned into panic. Even so, he still pretended to be calm as he said, "President Tillman." You should at least provide evidence if you want to convict me for such crimes. Evidence? By the time I retrieve the evidence, that will also be the time when I'll see you in court. Are you sure you want to get things to such an ugly extent? Anastasia questioned him while crossing her arms in front of her chest. Today, she wore a white blouse and a high waist hip skirt. Dressing like this. She looked slender and mesmerizing while radiating a domineering aura at the same time. You should know that the team of lawyers under Pressgrave Corporation won't have mercy toward anyone in court. Anastasia stared at Gordon coldly with her pair of beautiful orbs. When he heard her words, the arrogance he had when he first entered was immediately suppressed. At this moment, he was scared out of his wits. Therefore. He instantly clenched his hands into a fist when he heard Anastasia asking him to resign. Glaring at her angrily, he wanted to lash out. You, however, before he could get the chance to do so, the door behind him opened. Immediately after, two bodyguards in suits speedily entered. As each bodyguard stood on the left and right side of Gordon, they gave him death glares as if to remind him not to go overboard. Once again. He calmed down his rage. Then he snorted. Fine, I'll resign. Once Gordon left, the bodyguards left Anastasia's office and guarded the entrance to her office. Later, Anastasia received an internal phone call. Reaching out, she answered the call. Hello, I heard that you fired a few of the executives. Elliot's low voice came from the other end of the phone. Well. You know that I can't let him continue to bleed bourgeois dry. I won't tolerate the existence of such a character in the company. She explained as she spoke. There was rather a resolute vibe in her tone. I'll support whatever my wife does, but make sure to tell me first when you encounter danger next time. Elliot reminded her he had earlier received a SOS call from Grace. According to Grace. She said there was a male manager who barged into Anastasia's office. Since Elliot was outside, he could only assign the bodyguards to protect her first. Anastasia wasn't psychologically scared of anyone, unlike Elliot. Perhaps this had something to do with her toughening herself up since young. Hearing Elliot's words, she smiled and uttered, "Sorry for making you worry. The family's safety always comes first in my heart." When she heard the serious tone in his voice, she also looked at this matter in a more serious manner. I promise you that I'll learn to protect myself. Remember to ask Adriana to accompany you always. Elliot exhorted. Coincidentally, today was the day that Adriana was on leave. Thus, she wasn't on Anastasia's side. However, Anastasia decided to keep quiet about this after she sensed how worried Elliot was. Sure, got it. By the way, how are things at the financial summit? I've met a few acquaintances earlier, so I'm probably going to be home a little late. Understanding the situation Elliot was in, Anastasia commented, "Sure, I'll coax Jared to sleep first. Then, at this time, there was a knock on the door. Hence, she could only add, 'Well then, I'll hang up first. Bye.'" He hummed as a reply to her. After hanging up the phone. Grace came in to deliver an urgent document. Due to the fact that Bourgeois had swiftly eliminated the pests in just a day and cleaned up the vibe in the office, those who intended to dawdle became tense. In the meantime, the financial summit was held inside a grandiose hall. Standing in the center among a few of his foreign acquaintances, Elliot was discussing the future economical direction and development with them. At this moment. A sexy figure gradually approached them, with the staff pass hanging around her neck and her alluring attire. Lorelai made her way toward Elliot with a smile on her face. Elliot, what a coincidence! Lorelai greeted, looking at her. He nodded. Lorelai, Elliot, I heard that you're going to meet the richest person from Dansbury. 
It just so happens that I'm fluent in the language spoken in Dansbury. Let me be your translator. She shamelessly started promoting herself to him. That's fine. My translator will be here soon. Elliot didn't wish to trouble her. Elliot, give me a chance to help you. Lorelai started whining with crystal clear eyes. However, he simply waved his hand. Just go ahead with your business. After that, he brought his assistant, Ray, and left. Biting her rosy lips, Lorelai turned her and looked at Elliot's straight and charming back silhouette. Instantly, she felt down and depressed. Could it be that Elliot doesn't want to give me a chance to get close? To him just because I've shown signs of seduction last time? If he thinks I'll stop, then he's wrong. I'm not a person who would give up so easily. Since the day I was born, I know that I'm just a tool of interest that my dad used to acquire Presgrove Corporation. I have no way out, so I must endure the hardship and charge forward. Later, when the party was held at 5 o'clock p.m., Lorelai purposely seduced a foreign businessman. She knew this businessman had been lusting over her beauty and he even touched her from time to time. Even so, she still decided to endure him in order to carry out her sinister plan later. Chapter 695 When Lorelai saw Elliot entering a private room to rest, she purposefully led the businessman to the door of the room where Elliot was. Don't do this. Let me go. Lorelai purposefully yelled in English, but the foreign businessman couldn't comprehend it, thinking she was catering to him and became increasingly brazen with his actions. During the tussle, she purposefully tore the front garments below her chest, which exposed parts of her skin. Elliot, who was taking a rest inside the room, undoubtedly became aware of the commotion and dimly recognized Lorelai's voice. He opened the door and she shoved the man in front of him away while yanking at her ripped clothes. In a panic, she yelled for help, Elliot, save me. After that, before he could even respond, she flung herself into his arms and her clothes were half open, which added an air of enticement to the situation. Go away! Elliot became enraged and yelled at the businessman. The businessman seemed puzzled. Wasn't it this girl who initiated it in the first place? Why was she now portraying herself as a victim? However, this man was not interested in taking the risk. As soon as he recognized Elliot Pressgrave, he frantically apologized and departed. What is happening? Elliot pulled Lorelai's hand away and helped her to sit down on the couch. She raised her head with tears in her eyes as she bit her red lips in embarrassment and looked at him with a weak gaze that drew a man's protection. Elliot, I am so thankful that I met you. Otherwise, I... She finished her word as she grasped her clothes with one hand, leaving her clothes just partially covered. I'll ask Ray to send you back, he said as he took off his suit and placed it on her. Then, your suit. Put it on first, Elliot said as he turned away from her. Thank you, Elliot, Lorelai replied. Gratefully as he contacted Ray to send her home, she wore the warm suit with a cool scented feeling and her sneer gave the impression that she was up to no good. To occupy a place in Elliot's heart, one had to first shatter his impenetrable marriage to Anastasia. At 1.00 p.m., Anastasia was sitting on the couch in a burgundy nightgown and reading documents. Ever since she started overseeing the operations of Bourgeois, she had a list of never-ending documents that she needed to peruse. She now understood that Elliot had to exercise a lot of effort in order to smoothly run such a large corporation. In contrast to Elliot's company, Bourgeois had less than a thousand employees to manage whereas he was in charge of tens of thousands. While she was reading, she became aware of the approaching sound of a vehicle and after a little while, she looked up and spotted her husband standing near the elevator in the basement parking lot. At first glance, Anastasia recognized that something wasn't right when he returned today. Yes, that was his suit, which he wore when he went out. This man was now dressed in merely a white shirt and a black tie. She then asked in curiosity, where is your suit? Elliot explained, Lorelai and I met today at the summit. A foreign businessman assaulted her and tore her clothing. So, I lent her mine, a shocked Anastasia kept her pleasant smile. Really? Is she all right? He said, 
it's okay, after that, he stepped over to embrace her before asking, was it on purpose to dress like this while you wait for me? Before she could answer, the man held her cheek, kissed her red lips, and said in a hoarse voice, it's time for your husband to take a shower, Anastasia was speechless. Could she say that she was so exhausted that all she wanted to do tonight was to sleep, even though he made it look like she wanted him? However, the man had already gone to take a shower while she sat on the couch, unable to read the documents. Did Lorelai meet my husband by coincidence after she was assaulted? To what extent were her clothes ripped? The summit is a rigorous international conference. Security personnel are stationed inside the building and guests from foreign nations are advised to maintain their composure. How are they able to hurt Lorelai in any way even to the extent of tearing her clothes? After Anastasia's assessment, she concluded that Lorelai was just utilizing a seduction tactic as a woman's sixth sense was typically extremely accurate. Last time at the wedding, despite Lorelai's tremendous repression and affectionate behavior, Anastasia could tell the woman was thinking about her husband. Chapter 696 Moreover, her father had been keen to seek Elliot's assistance, which was why he allowed his beautiful daughter to be at his side as it was the easiest and most direct thing to do. Anastasia lifted the teacup off the table as her stunning eyes narrowed slightly while she needed to give Lorelai a proper warning. She would not, in any way, tolerate another woman interfering in her relationship with her husband, who was not just the father of her son but also her husband. When it came to protecting her marriage, Anastasia would never be lenient. Anyone who tried to meddle with her marriage would be held accountable for their actions. At night, she was so tired that she fell asleep in her man's arms. Her hair was messy and Elliot kissed her face, which was still red. The woman's delicate oval face in his arms appeared weary in the faint light. He couldn't help but smile since this was his accomplishment and he had every reason to be pleased with himself. Lorelai was unable to sleep in her apartment. She hung Elliot's suit on the rack in front of the bed. The uniron clothing remained smooth and wrinkle-free. In her mind's eye, she could see him donning this outfit, which complemented his good physique. She stood up in her pajamas and had a seductive aura as she pulled the suit from the rack, held it in her arms to return to bed, after which she sniffed the man's scent on the suit and moaned softly. She longed for the day when the owner of this outfit would come and lie next to her, embrace her, and fall asleep. Do you realize how much I like you, Elliot? Her eyes were welling up with tears, as though she was grieving. In the early morning, Anastasia got up to check on her son and saw that Jared was already clad in a school uniform, giving the impression that he was well prepared for his day at school. Mommy, he affectionately extended his hands for a hug. She kissed his little head and sniffed it once more. Perhaps all mothers found it comforting to smell the scent of their own child. You smell wonderful, mommy. He sniffed her like a puppy, after which she carried him into her arms and replied, brush your teeth and wash your face. Elliot had already dressed up. A white shirt was always his favorite outfit and it made him relaxed whenever it was matched with a pair of suit pants. While their kid was inside the restroom to brush his teeth and wash his face, Elliot took advantage of the opportunity to embrace his wife and look at her attire for the day in a way that indicated he was examining it. He also firmly buttoned the second button on her shirt, which she had purposefully left undone when she dressed in the morning. Then, he commanded her in a low voice that sounded envious, don't unbutton it, can't I unbutton it even if it's hot? Anastasia chuckled. Then, lower the temperature of the air conditioner, Elliot simply did not want anybody else to see her assets and added, I'll send my son to school, head to the summit, and ask Adriana to drive you to the company, okay? Go ahead. She nodded. Jared followed his father out the door as Anastasia observed their car drive away. She checked the time, produced her phone, and dialed Lorelai's number. Lorelai was also about to head out. When she heard the phone ring, she grabbed it and looked at it. Hello, Anastasia, she answered with apprehension. Lorelai, are you okay? Elliot mentioned last night that you were harassed by foreign guests, 
Anastasia asked out of concern. Uh, I'm all right. Thankfully, he helped me out. Lorelai hastily responded. That's what Elliot should do as long as you're all right. I'm fine. Thank you, she replied with a smile. Are you available at noon? Let's have a meal. Anastasia asked her. Sure. After all, I need to return Elliot's suit to you. Lorelai answered Anastasia grinned as she hung up the phone. All right, let's meet at noon. She didn't want Lorelai to use the suit as an excuse, so she went out of her way to request that it be returned. Lorelai heaved a sigh of relief as she looked at the suit that she had held all night. She was actually hesitant to return it and even pondered taking the suit back to Elliot one day since it could be considered as an opportunity to meet the man. She was suddenly acutely aware that Anastasia was keeping a watchful eye on her. She thought that all of her thoughts were very well suppressed, but she couldn't escape from Anastasia's observant eyes. Chapter 697 In the afternoon, Anastasia made a call to Lorelei before she left for the restaurant where she had made a reservation. Lorelei was the first to arrive between the two as she set off from the company. Around 1 1.50 a.m., a woman in business attire turned up by the entrance. She had her raven hair styled in an updo. Her whole appearance set her off gracefully, giving her amorous vibes. Lorelai had heard from her father that Anastasia had taken over Bourgeois. She always thought Anastasia would be content with being a housewife, so Lorelai was surprised to see the woman become a chairwoman of a jewelry company right after marriage. It was obvious that Anastasia was not a woman who lacked motivation and only sought pleasure in her life. Having her own career turned her into a more competent woman. A woman like her was more attractive than ordinary housewives, and it was hard for men to resist her charm. Anastasia didn't even need the help from Elliot to shine. Lorelai couldn't help but feel envious of her, as Anastasia got off on the right foot with a favorable background of her husband's family. No matter how hard Lorelai tried and how determined she was for her goals, as long as her family could not provide her with a better opportunity, she would still need to work for others. On the contrary, Anastasia was managing a listed jewelry company right after marriage, which had a market value of more than 10 billion. Anastasia, Lorelai stood with a smile as Anastasia made her way to the table. Long time no see, with ease, Anastasia took a seat opposite her. I heard that you had taken over Bourgeois. You are amazing, Lorelai gave her a heartfelt compliment. You are thinking too highly of me. I am just trying to find something to pass time because I get bored at home. Elliot wants me to have fun rather than trying to make a killing, there was a hint of love in Anastasia's tone as she said that. Lorelai had a smile on her face, but the smile did not reach her eyes. That's quite sweet of Elliot. Happiness was written all over Anastasia's face. You're not wrong. Other than my dad, he is the second man who spoils me rotten. When are you going to have a second child? I remember that Jared is going to be seven soon, isn't he? Lorelai was curious. We're not making any plans at the moment. It will come naturally, Anastasia smiled at the thought. Just then, her phone rang, interrupting their conversation. Excuse me for a moment, she nodded at Lorelai and picked up the call. Hello, at the end of the call, Anastasia had already made a decision. In the future, Bourgeois will never consider the artist from this company to act as our brand spokesperson throughout the call, Anastasia had remained a serious face and once she ended it, Lorelai could finally express her curiosity, what happened? Is something wrong? It was just about an artist who overestimated her own boundaries. Anastasia explained casually, but her eyes seemed to bore into Lorelai's soul. She tried to seduce Elliot right under my nose in a conference not long ago, but I happened to be aware of it. Lorelai's smile stiffened slowly, and she hung her head low in shame. That artist must be out of her mind to mess with you. I cut off her endorsement contract and gave her a warning. I am going to blacklist her if she dares to do it again the second time. At present, none of the artists from her company will be given the opportunity to become bourgeois spokesperson. Anastasia's smile was gentle, but her eyes pierced through Lorelai intensely. Lorelai's knuckles turned white as she held onto her cup tightly, 
unable to speak as a result. She was aware that it was a warning coming from Anastasia. Do you think I made the right choice? Anastasia questioned with a hint of amusement. As if on cue, Lorelai agreed with her statement. Right, I thought so too. Nobody shall think about sabotaging. Your marriage, she is far from being a threat, more like an eyesore to get rid of, Anastasia sipped her tea and changed the topic. Let's not dwell on this matter. We shall talk about something else instead. Have job already? You found a I am currently working in a financial firm. Lorelai nodded at her. Knowing you, I have no doubts you could find a great job. However, it is important to seek love too. Anastasia smiled. I am devoted to my work and I don't have any free time to pursue a relationship. Chapter 698 I can introduce someone to you if I find them suitable. Anastasia was enthusiastic about the topic. I'm good. You don't have to. Lorelai gave a dismissive wave at her suggestion hastily. Anastasia didn't insist on it as Lorelai declined. In the meantime, the food was served, so they had steered their conversation to other topics. Anastasia believed that the latter could understand her meaning, even though she had not spoken the obvious. After finishing their lunch, they both got up to leave. Lorelai took out a suit and showed it to her. This is the suit Elliot wore yesterday. Do you need help to send it for dry cleaning service? There's no need to trouble you. I will do it myself, Anastasia said as she took the suit from Lorelai. Once they got out of the restaurant, they parted and Anastasia pointed at a car not far away. My car is over there. See you next time then, goodbye. Lorelai watched Anastasia as she got in the car, where a female bodyguard was waiting in the driver's seat. The car then sped away. When the car was out of sight, Lorelai could finally let out a sigh of relief. Anastasia was not a woman to mess with, as she insinuated her disapproval of Lorelai's misbehavior. On the other hand, Anastasia took out Elliot's suit and ordered Adriana, the suit is ruined. Deal with it, all right, madam. Anastasia thought it was a waste of the nice suit. However, it was now ruined by another woman's scent. She wouldn't keep it and wouldn't let Elliot wear it either. She would not be generous when it was concerning her relationship, and she had no other hopes but for Lorelai to behave and stop stirring up trouble for her. Meanwhile, Sophia was doing household chores in Arthur's villa. She was alone in the villa. Emily had gone out shopping while Arthur had some matters to attend to. Sophia started with organizing his study table, followed by cleaning the dust on every surface. A familiar signature caught her eyes when she was sorting out Arthur's files on the table. The signature pressed hard to the paper, showing a hint of grace from the owner's personality and a no doubt belonged to Arthur. Sophia crouched under the table for a better angle to clean. Just then, someone pushed the door open and it startled her, so she hurried to stand. Suddenly, a thump echoed in the room. As Sophia tried to stand up, she bumped her forehead into the table. Arthur stared at her with wide eyes from the doorway. He found her holding a cleaning rag in her hand, while another hand was pressed to her forehead. What are you doing? That was all he could manage to ask. I'm cleaning the table, Sophia answered meekly. Taking in mind her eagerness, Arthur walked toward her and took a close look at her forehead. There was a bump on the spot where she hit hard on the table. You should use a cold compress, I'm all right. Sophia didn't mind the pain. However, just when she was about to continue the chore, Arthur put an arm around her waist. Shocked, she quickly leaned backward, but he seized the opportunity and pressed her against the table. You just can't wait to repay me? He teased and closed in. Before her were a pair of eyes as black as night and cold as stone. They were clear but full of mystery. Sophia felt pressure alone just by looking at Arthur. Her lips slightly parted in disbelief because she had always thought that the man was cold and distant from the moment she first met him. However, right this moment, he was standing so close to her underneath the afternoon. Son, I, I do think about repaying you. Sophia spoke with hesitation. Then you shall do it as I prefer, he demanded. There was a sudden urge building inside him to taste her lips. Again, since he kissed her out of the blue in the hotel yesterday, 
the thought had started to linger on his mind. He had a need to confirm his thoughts, so he simply had to taste the sweetness on her supple lips. Without further hesitation, Arthur wasted no time and went in for a kiss on her lips. Doubly what? His bold actions made Sophia's mind go blank. Did he just kiss me again? Her lean body was soft under his touch. The feeling of their bodies pressed against each other on the table sent a tremor through Arthur's body, making him feel hot and bothered. The kiss lasted for a long time, as he did it again and again, to prove he was right. Passion filled the study room. With her eyes shut, Sophia responded to him eagerly. He was forceful one moment and gentle the next, and she was surprised to feel happy from his actions as if they were in love. Finally, Arthur broke the kiss and pulled himself away. It was a cue to Sophia as she took to her heels almost immediately. However, passion lingered in the study room like a reminder to everyone that they had just shared an intimate moment. Chapter 699 Sophia gasped as she returned to the room like a frightened white rabbit. As she covered her red lips, all she could think of was the man's cool yet domineering kisses, which was way beyond her acceptable limit. The impression that Arthur gave her was one of abstinence or was it her illusion? He even mentioned earlier that he wanted to repay her through his own methods, so she suspected that he meant her giving herself to him. He stood in front of the window walls with one hand in his pocket. Dressed in a black attire from head to toe, he carried with him a tough posture while his gaze reflected the facial expression of his cold, handsome face. It also did not help that his breath had become a tad bit unstable. I'm having feelings for Sophia. What the hell is going on? His thoughts were proven earlier when everything was spilled out on his desk. Emily returned from her gallivanting outside as today was yet another shopping spree for her. Behind her was a servant who entered with the items that Emily had purchased. All of you should head downstairs. The said servant left the items and departed while Emily raised her head to call, Sophia. Sophia pushed open the door to make her presence known and responded from upstairs. Miss Jennings, come down and help me to tidy up, Emily instructed as she sat with crossed legs. After Sophia came downstairs, Emily asked her to remove the items from their bags to organize them. Then, Emily announced the price of each item that Sophia took out. This is a limited edition pair of high heels with a value of 180. Please be careful with it. This pair of silk pajamas cost me 90,000. Even a single thread cannot be damaged. This purse has a purchase price of 1.8 million. You won't be able to compensate me if you damage it. Sophia was speechless upon hearing Emily's words. She could never agree with Emily's concept of consumption. Obviously, she was not jealous of Emily either because she was aware that Emily could use shopping as a way to pass her time. Arctic, do you think that the dress I bought would look good on me? Emily took a skirt and compared it to her physique. Arthur's hand was on the banister as he stared at the girl bending over to arrange the shopping hall. When Sophia heard footsteps behind her, she was so frightened that she dropped the bag on the floor and collapsed. Emily was shocked when she saw the scene before her and blurted out, You had the nerve to drop the most expensive bag. I'm sorry, Sophia apologized quickly. His long legs walked toward Sophia and he ordered thereafter, Come out with me. Now, she lacked the courage to look Arthur in the eye. Yes, the man left first, after which she informed Emily, Miss Jennings, let me head out with young Master Weiss first. Artie, where are you going? Let me accompany you there, Emily said as she hurriedly followed. Since Arthur did not allow his bodyguard to drive the car, he slid into the driver's seat of an SUV and informed the bodyguard not to tag along. The bodyguard immediately replied, Master, we need to ensure your safety, Arthur insisted. You are not to come along. Sophia sat in the passenger seat as he drove away from the gates of the villa. Young Master Weiss, where are we going? She asked in curiosity. Let's go to a place where we can clear our minds. Clear our minds? She thought about it and asked, how about a church? He maintained his focus on the road ahead of him as he answered, that works. After punching the address on his navigation system, 
she couldn't help but feel restless. She couldn't ignore the fact that whatever happened between them earlier in the study was a fact. She secretly shot a gander at the man who was behind the wheel and admired his pursed thin lips, his sexy and handsome features while such an action had caused her heart to race. It was so quiet in the vehicle that Sophia could hear the sound of her heart beating. Arthur, on the other hand, remained reticent throughout the entire journey. It was already 3.00 p.m. and would take them more than an hour to arrive at the church. By the time they arrived, the mid-afternoon prayer session would have been concluded and the parishioners leaving church grounds, thus the surroundings would be quiet. As the sun was starting to set, it illuminated the historical place of worship with a kind of serene beauty. He was dressed in all black and had an aura of distance to him while Sophia went ahead to light up a candle at the front of the altar. When she emerged, she saw him standing next to the door in his slim and graceful height, which gave rise to a thrilling beauty. Chapter 700 Sophia was in her own world for a few seconds until the man's deep gaze landed on her. It was only at that moment when she regained her composure and approached him. Suddenly, she almost lost balance due to the slippery road beneath her. Ah, uh, she yelled as she lost her balance and fell into his arms. Arthur wrapped his arms around her to prevent her from falling, but he was a second late. As Sophia hugged the man, she landed in a kneeling position in front of his legs and her face was exceptionally close to a place in which a man would regard as sensitive. She wanted to die on the spot. He lowered his head and sighed because in all his time of knowing her, this was the umpteenth time of seeing her embarrassed. Luckily for them, there was no one around them. So, he reached out and helped her to her feet, but her face was redder than a shrimp. As sorry, Arthur took her hand as his long, slender fingers gripped onto hers. It was evident that he was holding Sophia in a posture that looked like they were about to kiss. They passed the entrance and walked up the steps, which they estimated to be at a distance of 200 meters, to where the main church was. It was halfway through the climb that Sophia regretted her decision as she panted. Of all the places that she could have suggested, why did she have to suggest a church on the hill? On the contrary, the man next to her was relaxed. He wasn't panting and his face wasn't flushed either. As the wind gently blew his hair into a somewhat messy state, it made him look just as sexy. You can't climb up anymore? Arthur asked with a smile. I, I still can, now that she was under his gaze, she bravely replied. I can even do it in one breath. Arthur continued his climb while Sophia forced herself to follow from behind as a film of cold sweat coated her forehead. Now that they were at the top of the hill, she felt that it was worth the hard work, since the view from where they were was breathtaking. The ancient church resembled a quiet place with a vast history behind it. He was holding a bottle of water, which he brought from the car. Then, he walked toward her and handed the bottle to her. Drink it! When Sophia saw that the bottle was half full, she realized that he had already drunk half of it and left the rest for her. What's up? Do you have something against my saliva? Arthur read her thoughts. She shook her head and sincerely took it with a blushing face before she unscrewed the bottle cap. Who am I to slander? We've already kissed, so what am I being picky about? Both Sophia and Arthur went to the main area of the church where candles could be found for them to use to offer their prayers. Then, she took six candles and lit it before handing it to him. Follow my actions and say your prayers. They say that miracles occur if you offer your prayers here, so hopefully it will be granted when he took it. He followed her suspiciously. Firstly, they left the bright candles at the candle holder at one side of the church before they walked to the pews and knelt down. Sophia was unaware that when she made a wish, the man beside her still had his eyes open as he observed her beautiful yet serious face. It was as if she arduously tried to make a sincere prayer. Once that was done, the corners of her lips curled up into a smile. When this happened, it caused Arthur to subconsciously follow suit and when he saw her bright red thick lips, his heart skipped a beat. As he observed her dazzling and long eyelashes, he hurriedly closed his eyes in a comical manner so as to pretend that he was in the midst of offering his prayers. 
Now that it was Sophia's turn to admire him, she realized that he still had not offered his prayers. He looked even more handsome now that his eyes were closed. His facial features seemed to have been meticulously carved by the angels above with perfect proportions. She softly swallowed and harbored inexplicable thoughts while watching him. What's going on? Is it because he kissed me? Her heart started to race as she thought of this. Wait, this isn't going according to plan. I'm the one who seduced him to make him fall for me, after which I'll beg for his forgiveness. So, why am I having second thoughts about him? Although Arthur's eyes were closed, he was a sensitive man and knew that Sophia was sizing him up. As a result, he purposely took his time to open his eyes. After emerging from the main area of the church, they arrived at the community center where she couldn't help but say, Young Master Weiss, this is where the young single people meet up to socialize with each other. Do you want to head in and get to know a few girls? Who knows you might be able to meet your miss, right? Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe for more videos.